select board meeting for Monday, April 19th. Um, first order of business is to approve the agenda unless there's any changes. Anyone have any changes? Yeah. I would like to make an addition about community correspondence and put it under select board business after letter D about the trainings. Anything else? Yeah, if I could add liquor licenses for taxis and the wine vault. Okay. I don't know if everyone's getting, but there's a lot of feedback coming from people's discussion. Yeah, I, I forgot all about it too. It might be mine. I have a fan on my computer that's relatively uh, loud, so I'll mute when I'm not talking. So it's not. Uh, but I also suggest anyone else mute if uh, if you're not trying to speak. Um, okay, um, so we will. I'll take a motion with those changes. I make a motion to approve the agenda as as amended. I'll second that. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, consent agenda items, meetings from April 5th, liquor licenses for Michael's on the Hill, Maxi's on the Wine Vault, and the reemployments, three-year terms ending April 30th, 2024, Martha Pistakis, Planning Commission, Tom Kinley, DRB, George Lester, DRB Alternative, Bill Mittner, Recreation Committee, Paul Lawson, Recreation Committee, Steve Speech, Tree Committee. For four year terms ending April 30th, 2025. Joan Beard, Conservation Commission, Krista Battles, Conservation Commission. And for one year terms ending April 30th, 2020, Steve Lotch Beach, Tree Warden, and Transportation Advisory Committee Representative, and Alex, Alec Tuscany for Mad River Resource Management Alliance. Take a motion. I'll move to approve the consent agenda as written. With the, it got changed. There's two liquor licenses that got added. With, with the additions, yeah. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 <laughs> All right, uh, moving on to public. This is an opportunity for the public to speak on anything that's um, more not on the agenda. You are more than welcome to speak at any point um, when we get to agenda items, if you would like to um, add any input. Um, it's a little hard with Zoom, so there's the feature that you can raise your hand or you can put in the chat that you'd like to speak on an issue. Um, but if you'd like to speak right now, uh, go ahead. You can just unmute and go or uh, wait until a topic comes up. All right, I don't hear anyone from the public. So we are gonna move on to select board business interviews. Uh, we'll start with the planning commission. Two positions ending April 30th, 2020 and April 30th, 2024. Um, I'll just go in the order. So we are gonna start with Alyssa. Hi, Alyssa. Hi, everyone. How are you? Good. Um, <laughs> if you want, I mean, we're going to, since we have quite a few tonight, don't feel, unless the board has a bunch of questions, don't feel like you need to go into too crazy of detail, but we're excited to have anyone who's willing to volunteer. And if you want to give us a little background for maybe some on the board that might not know your background and why you want to join the Planning Commission. Great, thank you. I do have um, a full page of notes, but I'll try and be brief and abbreviated because I know not everyone does. Um, for those who don't know, my name's Ellis Johnson. I live on South Main Street. Um, I was lucky enough to serve for three and a half years as the economic development director for revitalizing Waterbury and the town. Um, so in that work, I had the opportunity to really get to know a number of members of the planning commission and to work with them really closely um, in a professional capacity. Um, I did do a total, I've been to 60 planning commission meetings professionally and another seven since I resigned from the position in December. So um, continues to be a real area of personal and professional interest. 
I guess the piece for me is that um, I feel like I have a strong understanding of the work the Planning Commission is doing. I've been um, in the room for a lot of the conversations for the past couple of years throughout the zoning rewrite process, which you all um, have become well immersed in, I would say, in the past couple of days or, or weeks. Um, so I have a strong background to kind of pick up from where that work is and be able to continue to move it forward. I think it's really important to have a set of guidelines for the community that um, are clear and transparent and easy to use. Um, in addition to working with the Planning Commission as part of my role, I also worked with applicants going before the Development Review Board, which was a nice side of seeing the work that the Planning Commission does in planning and creating bylaws and also how it's put into practice and maybe sometimes the disconnect between the two or just beyond the idea of just planning in a general sense, um, what it actually looks like on the ground. I've really appreciated the Planning Commission's openness to collaboration. Um, I worked with them on a sign bylaw um, mm -hmm. and some other interim regulations and they always were very willing and receptive to hear my comments. So just in a broader sense, I've appreciated that transparency and would wanna continue that. Um, I, you know, am a young professional and a renter, so I do think that housing in the community is important and um, appreciate the opportunity to be involved in planning for how we can have a community that is welcoming to all of the folks who want to live here. Um, my day job now is for the Vermont Council on Rural Development, so I guess my last point would be I just think Waterway has a huge wealth of assets, um, you know, the community and the folks who live here and volunteer and participate in the community and then also physical things like, you know, Bill will love the wastewater system and EFUD. Um, I work with a lot of communities now who go through a whole deliberation process and what they decide is really important for the future of their community is a water and wastewater system. Um, and we already have it and we wanna see it being used well and incorporated into our planning. So um, that's my last piece. Um, but yes, my overall thing would be, I've been deeply involved with the planning commission. Um, now that it's not a professional conflict of interest, I would really love to join. Um, and I don't know what your process is. It looks like there is two terms, but um, I'd be in it for the long haul. So if the three year term is open, um, I'd be happy to serve and happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Great, thank you so much. Um, board members, any questions for Alyssa? No, I'm just kind of glad to see she's sticking around. <laughs> I think her, her knowledge and input would be valuable to the community. I kind of second that. We've worked with Alyssa so much with RW and I think she would be an excellent addition to the planning commission. Great, any other board members? Um, that is a good question. Can someone explain the two positions and are, do we decide on, or I mean, we can certainly ask Steve if he has an interest in one or the other. I'm not sure what the process is there for the two positions. Yes, my, my guess is that Somebody uh, left the position, so there's a, a year left on that term. Uh, and then uh, the other one is uh, the normal three-year term. Um, the board has the discretion to appoint whomever they want to fill whichever term. Um, so Alyssa's expressed interest in the three-year term. I'm sure she'd take the one-year term if that's all that there was, but uh, it's really the board's the board's choice. Okay, great. Any other questions for Alyssa or we can move on to Steve? All right, all right thank you, Alyssa. Hi, Steve. Hi, how y'all doing? Good. Um, same, if you wanna just give us a little background on yourself, why you're interested in the Planning Commission and then if you have an interest in either the one year or three year term and yeah, sure. the floor is yours. All right. Um, well, this will be kind of just the opposite of Alyssa. Um, I've not been to 60 uh, commission meetings or any other such meetings like that here. Um, I've been here, living here in Waterbury about eight years. Uh, lived in uh, Essex since the late 80s uh, until uh, moved to Kentucky uh, a few years ago. Um, spent a few years down there and then came back and decided to settle here in Waterbury. It's a place we ended up coming to play on weekends and enjoyed. Um, when we lived up in Essex, um, seemed like a nice place to, to end up. 
Um, and so been back here about eight years. It just seems like it's in, in the last few years um, with job responsibilities have, have gotten a little bit lighter. Um, I've got a few fewer nonprofit boards that I serve on. Um, and so it seemed like a good time to kind of get more involved with the, the community. Um, and in the last year, uh, working from home, it, uh, now I'm, I'm not just here in the evening. Um, uh, I'm here all day long. So uh, it's made much more of a connection. Um, my, my day gig, uh, I'm a CFO and a facilities guy. I've done a lot of campus planning, um, campus financial uh, CFOs. Uh, right now I'm a CFO for the Society of St. Edmund, which is the order of priests that uh, founded St. Mike's. I work up there on the St. Mike's campus. Um, and I, I also have a, a financial consulting um, business on the side. Um, in, in the role, in my roles on campus, I've ended up doing a bunch of campus planning. I've worked really closely with, um, with select boards, councils, um, on, on large construction projects that involved uh, campuses and also involved uh, the, the communities that we lived in. Um, I was a CFO at VSAC when we did the downtown development up in uh, Winooski. Um, so, uh, you know, depending on how you look at the behemoth there on the traffic circle, um, that was either good work or, um, or work that you don't like, but it was uh, a big community development project that, that I was involved with. Um, so I've always had a, an interest and, and kind of a, an affinity for some of these kinds of community and campus development uh, plans. Um, when I saw Carla send out the, the, the note on uh, Front Porch Forum a few weeks ago, um, like I said, I've, I've been kind of looking for ways to be involved. Um, I ran for JP last time, so I'm a justice of the peace for the community now. Um, and, and this looked like a good opportunity to, to take a look at what was out there. The Planning Commission, as far as the zoning, uh, working the regulations, um, really, I think, providing a, a, a a foundation for for kind of good and appropriate growth. Um, it just seemed like a, a good match for my interests. Um, since it was open, it seemed like the one to, to take a look at and kind of jump into the jump into the ring. Um, so I'm happy, you know, happy to, to be able to be involved more in the community more in some of these kind of planning aspects that I that I feel like I do have pretty good background in. Um, and then as far as the, 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 the terms, you know, Alyssa is, is eager for the, the long one. That's great. Um, I'd be happy with a shorter one and then to see what happens the next year as uh, the next year comes around. Great. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, yeah, I mean, I have a question or two, but I'll let the rest of the board go first if they'd like. Got any questions for Steve? Yeah. Um... Steve, having grown up here in, in the state and seen change from when I was a young guy, you know, boy, till now. Um, when I was younger, I came accustomed to the ruralness of Vermont. And now I'm in the construction business because back when I was fresh out of high school, there was really only two opportunities back then. One was farming, the other one was construction, um, Vermont hadn't been opened up to the rest of the opportunities of the world. Um, so for me, it's always been a struggle, uh, double-edged sword kind of thing between earning a living in the business that I'm in and seeing my la the landscape around me disappear. Um, from, from your perspective, um, how do you feel about, you know, development in Vermont and, in you know our future growth and where we should kind of should be heading and what we should be protecting and yeah yeah that, that, that's a good question I, I grew up in a, a real small town in upstate New York um, much much smaller than Waterbury so I'm, I'm a rural guy myself um, and and first came when I first came in the late 80s it was to work at St. Mike's I'd never been to Vermont um, from the other side of the the lake a few hours but hadn't traveled much hadn't been here um, got here and and loved loved Vermont. Uh, the the ruralness, um, the the kind of controlled aspects of of growth, um, the, the kind of tr making every effort to preserve um, to preserve the environment certainly, um, 
and and I've I've been a sustainability VP at one of the colleges, one of the really green colleges, um, and so have been really interested in in that aspect and had uh, forests um, that I've worked with. Um, so it's it's you know it's a balance. Uh, you know, I'd love it would be lovely to to have everything stay rural um, in the way that we'd like it. Um, it's 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 also not practical and not fair, frankly. As as we get a little bit older, and we've kind of found our places to be and our ways to to live, um, you know, we've got to provide we've got to provide opportunities for for my kids, um, one of whom still lives here in the community um, and struggles to find housing and and things like that. So I, I think that one of the things that's attracted me to Vermont, I've moved here three times. So I, I came here the first time, moved away for a job, came back within two years, took this job in Kentucky because it was a sustainability job and really an interesting place, and was there for about six years, and, and then it was time to move back to Vermont. Um, I keep coming back for for that that really wonderful balance of, of, of the outdoors, of, of the environment, um, and, and and a place that is 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 active and is is kind of culturally relevant, uh, you know, especially for such small towns. You know, we've we've kind of got the best of both worlds, um, as far as the outdoors and the ability to enjoy arts and and um, and, and be able to support local businesses that are that are doing things. Um, so I, I'm 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 very much very much interested in that balance. Um, that you know, I don't want to. I would I would hate for us to to just kind of revert to uh, what I've seen in some other parts of the country. Whereas you know, if you've got a piece of land, you, you can build anything you want, and they they do, and it's it, it gets out of control um, quickly. You know what I've seen here um, with the the focus. I've done a little bit of little bit of reading and research on where we are with the the updates of the plans for especially the downtown, um, and and I think it's 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 an approach. It, it's an approach that balances. Um, the need and the desire to grow uh, intelligently and appropriately um, with still really preserving uh, preserving the, what we've got. Us, to your to your point about moving away and coming back, us fools that are too stubborn to ever leave, uh, regardless of the circumstances, we, <laughs> we have a nickname for, for people that move away and call them boomerangs. Yeah, they always yeah. they always come back. You know, exactly <laughs> once they get a taste of Vermont, they can't get away from it. So yeah. even though they try, they always come back. That's it. The grass is greener, even in the middle of January. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> That's all I had, Mark. Thanks. Okay. Anybody else on the board? Um, Steve, you said you lived in Essex. Any opinion on what you saw that Essex was doing differently than Waterbury that in good or bad way and then I guess my question to you is that you know I think housing is something that I've been a big proponent I I'm an employer in town I watch the struggle of my employees find housing um, I have I got hit up today with a, an adult friend who can't find housing and wants to live in the community but it struggles to find it um, you know I think there are some solutions there that I think some of this um, you know work on the zoning rewrite will actually um, hopefully entice some development in the downtown area that, you know, moves the density, hopefully downtown and keeps it from sprawling too hard. But I think we, we definitely have a vacancy rate issue that I would love to see the planning commission really take on and make a plan for a five, 10 year goal of additional units, I think, to, to approach that problem. Um, but any other thoughts on housing? You know, I think the other thing too there is that, um, Grand list growth over the last couple of years has really helped keep our tax rate somewhat stable. And I think that that's an important thing that we can't forget. Um, but yeah, any, any thoughts on the housing, specific housing ideas? Uh, you know, the, the downtown, the downtown development and, and a density in a downtown, um, you know, is, is a sensible approach. It, it's hard to see. I mean, one of the things I see back in Essex, uh, in Essex Junction, uh, we lived in the junction. Um, it was what was a that nice little downtown area. It, it, it's hard to see it right now because of the the density of growth that's happening there, um, and yet at the same time there was there's clearly a need for for housing um, there, especially for affordable housing. Um, and so I, I think that that's an appropriate way to go. Um, you know the 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 downtown 
the attempt to create a downtown for Essex uh, up the road on 15 is kind of a curious one um, that I'm not sure it works because it's still so vehicle centric. Um, and that's one of the challenges with a town like Essex, the town of Essex that really doesn't have a downtown. It's kind of spread out. Um, that, that, that centralized kind of downtown development planning doesn't, doesn't really have an option or an opportunity to, to take until you've got a, a certain a certain density already there. Um, and, and so it's interesting to see what they're doing up there. Um, I, I think that it's, it, it's, it's essential. Um, we need to be doing it, but we need to find ways to do it, um, do it well and try and find a way um, to entice and encourage folks to, to, create, um, to create housing that, that is, is you know, multi, uh, multifamily, but also that, that allows for different income levels. You know, it's, it's the young professionals, the ones that you see in the front porch forum, the ones that, that I see and I, I, I hear about um, that really are struggling to find places here that are, are affordable. Well, they're, they're, they're not finding places at all right now, but the affordability is a real issue. Um, and, and, you know, if there are ways that we can, uh, that we can use some of our, our, our planning uh, regulations and our, our, you know, whatever kind of carrots that we have along with sticks to, um, to encourage um, mixed use and, and, uh, and, you know, mixed income uh, housing, I think that it, it behooves us to do that. It makes the community stronger. Um, I don't think that any of us want to end up with, uh, with a community that, that only the, the richest can live in the richest and those who are already here. Thank you for the response. Um, any other board members have any questions or comments? And then do we need um, someone on the board to make a motion to place um, in the two terms? No. If no, anyone have any other comments or questions for either candidate or I would entertain a motion for placement. Just a comment before we make a motion. It seems like Steve was willing to do the one year term and Alyssa would be the three year term. Is that okay with both of you? Good question, Mike. I was just thinking the same thing. Which one they wanted. That's fine with me. Works for me too. Okay. Therefore, I'll make a motion to appoint uh, Alyssa Johnson to the three-year position on the uh, planning commission and Steve Karcher uh, to the one-year position on the planning commission. Okay. Is there a second? Second. All right. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Great. Welcome to the Planning Commission. Thank you so much for your volunteering, and we look forward to working with you. Very much. Thanks, and see you next week for the interim bylaws. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, all right. We are moving on to the Development Review Board alternative. Alternative. Um, one position ending April 30th, 2024. Joseph works Parker. where are you at in my grid there you are hi joseph um Hello. same same thing um give us a little background about yourself why you're interested in the position and if the board has any questions feel free to follow up with questions for joseph all right uh, my name is uh, joseph works i live here in waterbury center i've been here since 2011 uh i moved from vermont uh, from new jersey um there's a lot of places I could have retired to, but we decided on Vermont uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, I worked, I came up here, I started at the Alchemist and I worked there for eight years. And then I left there and then I, I now work for the United States Postal Service, delivering all those Amazon packages that everybody has been ordering since the pandemic hit. And uh, I was just looking for a way, since I was 16, I've always served my community mostly in the public safety sector. Um, so I just looking for a way to serve the community and a friend of mine uh, is on the development review board. And he said there was an opening here and maybe this is a good way to start somehow to serve the community. I don't have the experience that a lot of the, uh, you folks have in planning and things like that, but 
uh, I'm willing to learn and I'm just looking for an opportunity to serve some way to help make Waterbury uh, a better community. Great, thank you so much. Um, board members, any questions for Joseph? Yes, I have a question for Joseph. Hi, Joseph. Um, Hi, Mike. I have an affinity because I, I was an ex-DRB member. Uh, it's a very worthwhile board to be on. Uh, but question, I know you said you didn't have any experience in planning. Do you have any kind of a good grasp of construction and plans and those kind of things? Because you'll be reviewing those kind of documents on the DRB. Yeah, I was a fire inspector in New Jersey. And so there was plan review there, uh, pre-planning for uh, fire department funk. Uh, uh, fires and stuff like that. Um, I was a fire inspector, so um, I understand the construction, and but it's more on the fire end. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I worked for a carpenter for several years, and so you know I know how to take things apart and put things back together. And in regards to that, and I I've seen where in my community where I came from, um, good things that happened with planning, and some things that didn't. Good things, so. I mean, I have a lot to learn. Uh, I understand that. Thank you. That's a good way to go on is go on as an alternate. Because as a matter of fact, I know from the DRB, a lot of times we have used the alternates when, you know, a primary member, you wind up sitting in and learning. So mm -hmm. that's a really good way. Thank you for Thank that, you. that mm -hmm. answer. Any other board members have any questions for Joseph? Yeah, I will take a motion. I don't have any questions either. Thank you for considering um, volunteering and I'll take a motion if anyone would like to make one. I'll move to approve Joseph Wartzbacher for the position on the Development Review Board as an alternate ending April 30th, 2024. I'll second. Been made and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. Welcome to the DRB. All right. Thank you. I look, thank to, look forward to the opportunity to serve. Thank thanks, thanks for stepping up, Joe. Thanks. You'll have right. fun. Moving on, uh, it looks like we have a similar position as the Planning Commission. We have a number of positions. One position for a rec committee ending on April 30th, 2024. Another one ending on April 30th. 2022 and one ending on April 30th, 2023. We will start. What's that? Uh, Pete Martell has withdrawn. Oh, that's right. Okay. So we have three open positions, but two candidates tonight, correct? Correct. Yep. Uh, we'll start with Tom Scribner. Tom. Hello. Hi, how are you? All right. How are you all doing? Good. Um, you were in the meeting, I think, for the other interviews. So, uh, yeah, give us a little background about yourself. I know uh, the board and uh, we've interacted with you a little bit about some issue with um, the Frisbee golf. But, uh, yeah, give us a, a background and why you're, what your interest is in the rec committee. Well, worked uh, pretty closely with the rec board and the select board since November. Over really since over the past year, um, but it, it I just think it only makes sense and it'd be more effective to just be on the committee. But in terms of my personal experience, been around town for 35 years. Um, I uh, I coached on the rec fields for. Um, I think we're getting some feedback. Maybe Meg, are you in the same room? Sorry. <laughs> um, uh I'm going to move away. I no think, problem. I heard it too. I'm like, I heard yeah, it, but I, I didn't. It happens sorry. when you have two people on a Zoom well, and her. Sorry about that. That's okay. I think we're all right. But, anyways, um, at 16, I was coaching youth soccer and I ran the town um, concession stand for the football, uh, youth football. Um, I coached in this town on all the fields. Um, I coached. Uh, for eight, seven or eight years. Uh, I, I've been involved with youth on the, 
the uh, middle school golf. Um, I helped, I was there the day that we put the playground in at Hope Davy. Uh, I raised my kids out in the multi-use area here. I fished in the Winooski. Um, made a, uh, actually, I with uh, Julie Roy, we landscaped um, the uh, gazebo park down uh, uh, that is, no, that's a, what's that? Uh, Rusty that. Parker Park. Yeah, right, Rusty Parker. We actually landscaped that with the children's room about 15, 20 years ago. So um, I've just always, uh, I really value recreation and outdoor activity, especially in, um, in younger folks, but it's also good for us as well. But uh, so anyways, that's, that's kind of where I'm coming from. Okay. Um, questions from the board? Is there anything outstanding, Tom, that um, that you'd like to see either added to the town or changed? Well, I, I just, I know, I've heard the discussions on the skate park. It seems like that's moving in a very positive direction. Um, there's a lot of work being done now with um, Hope Davy, and that seems like it's moving in a very positive direction. I think, um, especially with COVID, it's really highlighted the value of outdoor space in any community. And um, I feel like any town that you go to, when they, their parks are gems and they're clean, you'll see all ages making use of outdoor facilities. And uh, I just think it's a real, uh, I, I'm for positive change and for um, whatever needs to be done to try to improve the facilities that we have and uh, create as many opportunities for people as we possibly can. Any other board members have any questions? <clears throat> I guess um, my one question is just, and, and it'll be the same for, for Meg, just how to navigate. I know we've had some issues with the disc golf. Obviously, I hope that we can come to a solution on that, but how do you navigate joining the rec committee when maybe there's an open issue and, and how do you try to approach that being on the committee and, and working through it? Because I know Nick's been involved with that, um, but... but I've sought the involvement of the disc golf community for months. And uh, this morning I emailed uh, David Frothingham asking him to attend the meeting this evening, which he did. And he asked me, what about Clayton Davis? And I said, well, I talked to him and he has not wanted to be involved. Um, and he told me that uh, on the course about two or three weeks ago but he came tonight with David Frothingham. Neither one of them would have come if I had not reached out to them. So it's not about petty individual, you know, best interests. It's about what is best overall for the community. And that's, that's where I'm passionate. And uh, people, you know, get, you know, really vested and um, territorial and protective and whatever. And you have to be collaborative if you want to move some of these uh, things forward. You deal with it with a select board all the time. Um, so I have risen above a lot of the, uh, the differences in outreach and proactive um, interactions. And that would be no different if I um, am an actual uh, rec committee member. Yeah, your comment on the plan for the future, I think it's it, COVID, I think it definitely put people outside a lot more than previously, but we saw with the skate park, uh, you know, we got, we had some issues with noise and, and, and also just maintenance of a skate park that was kind of a, a subgroup created it and then there wasn't really an ongoing maintenance plan and I think the rec committee can really help Waterbury plan for growth and um, it'll be interesting to see exactly how the skate park um, design or idea comes to fruition. But I think, you know, there is something to be said for trying to figure out where 
things might need to go if they're not working where they currently are. So I think um, there are some options there, but it really is helpful to have a group like the rec committee fully focused on, on those activities and helping us as a board navigate those needs and wants. And, and we can try to help figure out if there's funding available and if not, what we might need from the community to, to create some of those items. But um, any other board members have any questions? Yeah, I do have a question. Um, I don't mean to be disrespectful or anything, but I, and again, I, I don't know both of you, but Tom and Meg, are you of the, of the same household? Yes, we are. Okay. The only reason I just bring that up, I always get concerned with any board or any kind of committee with multiple people from the same household as to, you know, how that could control voting. So maybe if both of you could comment on that, if you've, you've discussed that with the uh, recreation committee chair. Well, I, you know, it, it's easy from a distance to think that people are joined at the hip in thought, but we actually, uh, we have very different opinions on many different things. And if you spent any time with us, you would be more than well aware of that. And uh, we have quite a few differences, um, even around uh, what we're doing with the rec committee. So yeah. whether we're, you know, on the actual committee members or that we're, you know, working uh, in collaboration with the rec committee, um, that will that will be no different. I can relate to that. Me and my wife will also have very different opinions on things. So I, but so is the is the uh, rec committee chair? Oh, I'm sure they're aware, and if you've discussed that with them, that role. Frank has encouraged us to join. That's you okay. know we've been very involved with Frank, and he's like, you should, you two should be on the committee. Okay. And, I mean, uh, yeah, on the committee, and um, and that's and we hadn't even really thought about it, but given that there's openings, and given that there's an interest in an ongoing collaborative process, then it seemed like it only made sense if we're going to be doing it anyways. Understand. That being, that being your answer too, I think I'll just go right to Meg since she hasn't had an opportunity to speak, and then um. We can maybe the board can ask either one any questions after after she's done. Go ahead, Meg. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Meg Baldor, and um, I'm interested in serving on the rec committee because recreation in the town of Waterbury has really been the thing that I have loved the very best. I raised two children here, and from the time my daughter was nine months old, I guess she was in the shallow end of the Waterbury pool. So she went on to actually become the head lifeguard, um, swim team and all that stuff, my son as well. So we were really involved with that. And then, um, yeah, all the teams, the softball and the soccer and, and basically anything that there was for kids to do in town, my kids benefited more than I can ever say. And I have like gratitude to this town forever for the opportunities that it affords to young kids. And that even includes the library and the programs and all that stuff. So I've been really drawn to the rec committee uh, because I really have a passion for um, really opportunities for young children, uh, families, and actually all age groups. And I think Tom, you know, just started to say that he and I are very different people. Um, we're not joined at the hip at all in terms of stuff that we're interested in and passionate about, although we have, you know, commonality, of course. Um, I'm a public health professional, um, now retired, but I spent a lot of my uh, working life actually working with communities and especially disadvantaged uh, groups, trying to facilitate, you know, lots and lots of really uh, different sort of viewpoints sort of, uh, how can I say, competing um, wants and needs and trying to find solutions. So truly that's where I come from, very solution oriented. Um, in terms of, of being in town here, I served on the children's room board uh, when my kids were young and um, very active with that. 
I'm a member of Artie now, which is the garden club. And I'm really excited and, and hoping that we can really go forward with pollinator gardens and really doing a lot more bringing, you know, all sorts of people into the outdoors and also rejuvenating some of our natural resources. So that's something that I'm super passionate about. Um, I became a Tai Chi instructor. So mindfulness for kids, I sub in the schools, I'm involved with mindfulness and recreation for kids in the schools. And I've also done Tai Chi classes at the library and at the senior center. Um, yeah, and basically I'm just really passionate about uh, the outdoors in general and about ha uh, everybody having access to, you know, as many activities and natural places as they can. So that's, um, you know, really what brings me. And more recently, it's true, I've been involved with, um, you know, the Hope Davy natural area. Um, and that's really been really a process. It's been really eye opening. And I have just the utmost respect for the rec committee. And I think that we're really poised to, you know, make some really positive changes on all kinds of fronts. And it's really good working across lots of different groups of people and um, you know we're committed to that so I'm committed to that and and I'm saying we because the people who live in this house are, are very much committed to that too so I'm hoping that I can serve the community in a more you know formal sort of position and go forward and I'm super excited about all the stuff that Nick is doing in terms of really growing programs for kids um, would really like to you know have a a hand and a voice in, in guiding those efforts forward. So I think it'd be great. Great, thank you very much. Um, board members, questions for Meg. Yeah, Meg, I really appreciated what you said about being solution oriented. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious if there are some opportunities in town that you particularly see um, that you either have ideas for or that you've just identified as maybe um, problems, for lack of a better word, that you would like to help find solutions for? Well, thanks, Danny. That's a great question. Well, just because the Hope Davy Natural Area is so much in conversation right now, um, I was actually involved way back when, when Ben and Jerry's put the first path through there, like built that footbridge and then the path. So we were actually just at a community meeting uh, this evening and started talking about that. So in terms of an opportunity, like speaking with young families. And I think it's exciting that there's so many young people, you know, who are moving in and I see lots of, you know, little kids and stuff. It's just great. I'd like to really find some ways that we can bring young families and young people, small children, like back out into the Hope Davy Natural area. Okay, very much a shared sort of a situation, but it's been really interesting talking to different families and meeting people who are out there and I don't know a lot of people it seems maybe with COVID like people are you know spending time with their own families and trying to get outside but um, yeah I'd really love to see the community um, start to do some new planning about how some of these areas can be used across wider sorts of people not to take things away from groups that are using them I think we need to preserve all of our activities. But I do think that we have the opportunity in 2021, since all areas are being used really heavily, right? Like in our community, across the state, across the nation, right? Like people are outside and people are recreating. So I really think that we have an opportunity to sort of relook at where we're at, you know, kind of take the pulse and be mindful about engaging people appropriately and really finding a path forward, you know, to tweak things a little bit potentially, you know, depending on what people are looking for. So I hope that answered your question. Thank <laughs> you. I'd like to answer that question. Um, I considered two areas for a potential growth of town facilities. And that's um, one with um, in the area of disabilities to have more disability access to the current resources. Mm -hmm. um, if you go to any hotel and it's happening across the country, there's one pair of lawyers that are sending people to pools 
just to show that they don't have a lift for disabled people. And what they do is they threaten every hotel. And that's why every hotel has a lift for the pool. But, uh, you know, there is not a lift at the Waterbury pool unless something's happening. I'm not aware of. And I'm not talking about that specifically. I just think there should be some way for wheelchairs or whatever to be able to get out and enjoy, um, you know, special needs uh, youth and whatever, even the elderly should be able to get out and enjoy some flowers and fresh air and whatnot. Um, the second area that I see potential for is diversity. And um, I've spent a lot of time on Hope Davy, and it runs about 95% male. And um, there is very little, um, there's very little diversity and there's, there's no uh, disability access at all. Um, so I think there's a ton of room right there to open up uh, town resources to a subpopulation that um, uh, doesn't have as many opportunities as it might be able to have. Any other questions for Meg or Tom? Um, there are three positions available with different time frames. Um, any particular interest in specific terms? I don't, I don't think we, I don't really have an opinion about which one. Right, I don't either, Mark. I'm wondering if the town, you know, would have a, a preference with your experience um, filling uh, committee spots. I'd be willing to serve in whatever capacity people felt was most appropriate. Looks like we have a one, a two, and a three. Is that correct, Carla? It's, a, it's, I mean, uh, I think we can put it back on you. I, um, let us, do you have a particular, I don't think both of you can be the same because of how they stagger terms, so. I'll, I'll let her pick first. <laughs> okay, if I have to pick first, I guess I would pick the two year term. Okay. All right, I'll take the one. Okay. I will entertain, uh, oh, go ahead, Mike. I have, I have one more question. Thanks, Tom, for addressing it because you kind of stole the words out of my mouth with your comments about diversity uh, and inclusion. That was going to be one of my questions, but how would you also make town, rec either one of you, town um, recreation pro uh, programs more inclusive on an economic basis for, you know, lower income people? Well, I think uh, you have to target um certain programs and you have to you can't people that don't have the resources you know fuel rides whatever are not going to make it you know two to five miles somewhere to do something like you're going to have to have a more aggressive approach and you're going to have to have you know a uh, a van with a lift in it and this sort of thing and you're going to just have to gear up in a whole different manner um and have uh, specific programs aimed at populations. Maybe you can work with the, the school, the school um, uh, resources and special ed departments and whatnot and try and, you know, identify specific need populations that might be, might be best served. Thank you. And I have a small answer to that. Sure. I mean, basically, um, 100% trying to be as inclusive as possible and um, available to everybody. Um, I have to say that I don't know enough about the funding right now for how, you know, how certain things actually are supported, but I see that as you know, joining the committee and having a chance to actually learn about that and then, you know, making it focused. I can speak as a, as a parent long ago, it was really, really difficult. And I think it's the same now for folks, right? Like there's not enough spaces maybe for everybody who wants to be involved. And then of course, you know, other factors come into play that people can't access programs, but um, 
I'd really love to see Waterbury, as I'm, I'm sure we all would, to be able to be available to anybody and everybody who, who would like to access that. So that would be, you know, like a very much a top um, focus. But how we do that, I don't feel like I have the information to say. Um, I mean, let's do it. Yeah. Thanks. We all need to. We all need to learn and figure out. And you know, if you're on on the board. The more you learn, the more you could help help the community. Absolutely. Yeah, and answer some of that. Um, Nick, Nick will be able to answer a lot of those questions. Um, yeah. Some some things are funded by use fees. Some of them are funded. Um, you know, usually the rec program in a, in a whole runs in the red. Um, but it's always nice to see Nick's done a great job of creating some programs that have seemed to balance cost versus uh, on both sides, whether it's our cost to run the program and then on the other side, um, user costs and trying to keep things affordable. Um, right. We have struggled a little bit of, you know, facilities and not having sized facilities that might allow for some work because I know that some people use, you know, the summer programs as a form of childcare. And um, right. we have at times, and I don't know if it's gotten any better, I don't think it has in terms of, use of you know thatcher brook or other schools um you know we've we've always kind of talked about those facilities as sitting there but um not necessarily been able to utilize those maybe um as much as we'd like to hope and see but i think there's a lot of reasons on why that might be the case but nick or bill could probably speak to that better than maybe even some of us um but yeah it's a it's and then, uh, of course, like special project stuff, you know, we will try to fund things and it's always great to have a plan and really know ahead of time where we're trying to take something so we can budget well ahead of time because budget seasons always has a lot of asks and we hope to try to take care of things as much as we can, but sometimes it's difficult to yeah. fund it as we're trying to control spending and taxation. So, yeah. yeah. Any other board members have anything or I would entertain a motion. I move to, uh, what's the word? Appoint, nominate, appoint, approve. Um, Meg for the two year term and Tom for the one year term on the recreation committee. Second that motion. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Hi. Hi. Are we, we able to say thank you? <laughs> I'm in the dark. I wanted you to see. We can thank you too. It's I can't a, find any light. No, it's okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we look forward to your input on the committee and look forward to working with you. And hopefully we can make Waterbury work for all ages. And yeah, thank you. That very sounds much. great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Mark, I have a quick question and I'm not sure if it's for you or Carla or Bill, but so what happens to this um, last position that's open? Is that something that could still be filled later if there's someone that's interested? And then we would go through this process at another meeting? Yes, we don't, you don't have to be put into the, the terms can end and it can be a vacancy. And then if we find someone who's interested in the role or multiple people that want the same role, we can interview and appoint. So. Um, it doesn't have to be specifically when terms end, but it's always nice to have somebody take over right when a, when a term ends or some people don't fulfill their whole term, uh, as mentioned earlier, and, um, you know, a, a vacancy will be created and um, we try to fill those, those positions. So Danny, many times you'll see uh, commissions and boards, you know, do have vacancies and that's just the reality is finding uh, volunteers willing to step up and that's always you know a project for any any of these different committees so you know a lot of times they do run with you know a vacant position and they'll probably have an ongoing you know vacancy and then when they have someone they'll put it up to, you know confirm someone all right thank you very much for your volunteer and we're going to move on to conservation commission right, thank you thank you uh one position ending april 30th 2025 kelsey applegate is the 
where are you in my hope oh, there you are um how are you tonight good how are you good um i think you were here for the other interviews so give us a little background on yourself and why you're interested in the conservation commission okay um yeah so i moved here recently um after separating from the military so i did um I did five years as an airport manager for the Air Force uh, active duty. Um, so I moved around a lot and finally got the chance to choose where I wanted to live. Um, and I was really drawn to Waterbury for like for the access to the outdoors really was kind of one of the main things. Um, and this, you know, we have, a, we have access to a bunch of mountains for skiing and mountain biking and hiking. A lot of super fun stuff out here um but we also have this cool like après ski kind of culture and a lot of good food and um seems like a lot of really good community um so when i moved here i really wanted to give back to the community um so i you know i saw this on front front porch forum and really wanted to volunteer um and i think this commission would be really good for me because i'm uh i'm working on transitioning toward um, like a conservation career um, something with environmental justice. Um, so it's uh, a big passion of mine, um, you know, both for the, just the beauty of the outdoors and also for the importance of the environment on um, people's quality of life. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm a big skier and just always, always outside if I can be um, gardener and um, big hiker for sure. So um I'm passionate about helping people access the outdoors, but also, you know, conserving the environment for like for quality of life or, um, you know, I think people have a right to clean water and clean air. So um, just from moving around a lot uh, up until now, I've got exposure to a lot of interesting communities and, and different ways of doing things. Um, but I'm also here with, you know, a fresh perspective. I, I want to I want to volunteer. I want to like get to know the community and get to know what Waterbury needs from me. Um, and then hopefully use some of my project management and planning kind of experience with the military, um, but also get my hands dirty. So, you know, I want to, I want to be part of the meetings. I want to help plan, but I really want to um, build and conserve and get to know the, the local businesses and see if we can build relationships with them to, um, to make Waterbury, you know, to give Waterbury good access to outdoors, basically. Great. Well, thank you very much. Welcome to Waterbury and thank you for your service. Um, any questions for Kelsey? Mike, I see you're, yep, go ahead. Kelsey, uh, as a former member of the Conservation Commission, former chair of the Conservation Commission, uh, one, thank you for your interest. But I do like to ask, uh, how do you feel that we could achieve a balance between development and conservation? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, that's a really good question. Yeah, that's definitely something that, like, that I was involved in in the military. Um, the balance is different in the military because the mission always wins. Um, so, you know, if there's a wetland that's affected by flying operations. Um, sometimes that's there's not a whole lot we can do about that because we still have to fly the jets. Um, but I was involved in a lot of projects to like to move wetlands and and do studies to figure out exactly how we're impacting the environment. Um, so I have been involved in that balance before. I'm definitely excited to be on the civilian side now, so we can. I think we can achieve a better balance in our town here um but i you know i think there are definitely a lot of factors like the the wild that's crucial like wild spaces are crucial to um to fighting climate change um so they have value in and of themselves but the but people interacting with nature i think is super super important um because we are animals and we can't survive without nature. We can't survive without just the raw natural resources without the food and water and air. But also I, I think that humans can't thrive without access to, to greenery. There's tons of studies that show that that's so important to our mental and physical health. Um, 
so to me, that's the balance. I think if we think of it from a human standpoint, um, I really like what, uh, what folks were saying about diverse access uh, to spaces from the recreation committee. So I think they'll be awesome to work with. Um, but I think thinking of it from a, a human standpoint and a long-term kind of standpoint, um, it's never gonna benefit us to, to bulldoze down all the forests in our area. That might be good for short-term gain, but um, long-term we need those spaces for our future generations. Thank you for your answer and thank you for your military service. I appreciate it. Any other board members have any questions for Kelsey? If not, um, entertain a motion. I move to appoint Kelsey Applegate to the Conservation Commission for one position ending April 30th, 2025. Second. That's a long term. <laughs> <laughs> we all get a lot of work done in that time. Thank and you. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? I just wanted to say that if I uh, started asking questions, I wouldn't stop because uh, I have huge concerns about our open landscape and, and the way we treat this planet. Too big a discussion to have tonight for sure. Oh, yeah. All right, moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Well, Kelsey, welcome to the Conservation Commission. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, moving on, tree committee. Mike, I am not gonna try to do your last name, but if you wanna tell us how to say your last name. Thank you. Uh, it's Mike Lociavo, and thanks for having me, guys. Um, I. The, the, the main reason I think why, why, why I'm here is hopefully to provide some, uh, some tactical efforts for how we could bridge that gap between conservation and development. Um, first and foremost, my mother was a tree committee uh, member prior. She just retired, uh, Karen Maurice. She was also known as Carrie Gray. Um, but um, I, I grew up uh, in the White River Junction area a little bit south of here. Um, I went to UVM and kind of like a boomerang. I left the state. Uh, I joined up with Staples. I joined their commercial uh, and corporate division and their outside sales division. And basically, if I was willing to relocate, I was. Uh, I had a 15-year career ahead of me, and I had a chance to uh, live in Philadelphia, um, Buffalo, and Rochester. Uh, just north of Pittsburgh. I lived in New York City, just outside of New York City in Hoboken. Uh, about seven years ago, I had a hard look in the mirror and I just didn't, re I, I just didn't feel really good about um, myself and what I was doing. So I came back home to Vermont to, to visit my roots. And I ended up uh, starting a landscape company. Um, but we, we focused mostly in gardening. And my mother was very inspirational to me at that. Who would ever think that a parent would almost become a business partner? But um, she, she helped me understand how uh, living organi uh, organisms work and, and how they're dependent on one another. And I would always, she's a master gardener and she knows how to make things grow incredibly well. Uh, a lot of you uh, have had a chance to work with her in the garden. She's in the garden club. She does her best to be active. She's got quite a lot of gardens at home that keep me quite busy. But um, the, the relationship between trees and shrubs and mushrooms and fungus and the dependency that wildlife has, for example, the, um, uh, the gold wing uh, warbler, that one particular bird migrates a long, long way. And it needs to have food, just like when we drive for, for a road trip, we need to have food to get to Florida. Well, we're down to, I don't know, I don't know what the, the number, I think it's around 4%, but we have about 4% of original forests. When you look at America, these are the forests that were here before we came over and bulldozed it all over and tried replanting it and failed miserably. 
but we're, we're hopefully we're learning. And um, I started a, a, a gardening company and I've had the chance to work with Woody. Um, I, uh, I take care of the roundabout in town. If you guys ever take a look at that, I'm sure you do see it each and every day. And uh, part of the reason why it, it, it is one of the best in the state is um, because of how well it was planned and how it's being taken care of. And, um, you know, there's a lot of work involved in gardens, as you, many of you know. And, um, you know, the decisions that you make each and every season matter. Um, the things that we plant matter. Um, you know, I used to think that sometimes just clearing out an area and putting a hedge is maybe the right way to do it. But those natural systems that are in place matter. And um, I, I've been, um, you know, for example, like the Schutzfeld corridor, these animal corridors um, and these animal migration paths, it's important that each and every city have tree wardens, assisted tree wardens, and they work to fight disease. Um, uh, Steve has a, a great program going right over the tree committee right now. The Emerald Ash Corps is really getting involved. Um, and getting this, this town involved so we can get federal funds, state funds put into place. And, you know, one of the things I just hope to do is, is be an ambassador. And, and, you know, I play Frisbee golf. And there's a lot of people that play Frisbee golf that sometimes leave things out on the course. And we talk about collaboration. And that was a great question that Mike asked Kelsey about the balance between conservation and development. Because, guys, we, we, are in the red zone. We need to figure this out. Um, and there's a lot of towns that are figuring it out. Um, if you look at Essex Junction uh, and, and in Burlington, and, and there's a lot about the state that I don't know. I've only been back for about six years, but um, part of the reason why I'm in Waterbury is my mother has been here since 2001. And it has grown tremendously. And um, I, I love it here. Um, I love the community. I love how small it is, but how big it is. And I also love the fact that you have a lot of out-of-staters that come here and we can be a great example for them um, and, and how you can mix development and conservation. Um, so these are just things that uh, make me passionate about what I do. And um, I'm also thankful for having you guys' time and Steve also for having me. Um, apply for the tree committee. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I mean, I, obviously, I think you're more than qualified for the tree committee on the roundabout is, is gorgeous. Um, any board members have any questions for Mike? Before you ask a question, I just want to thank the select board too, though, for agreeing back when we built the roundabout that we wanted to take care of it and we wanted to have enough money in the budget to pay for the landscape. And it's, uh, it's a gateway to the community. Mike does a great job there, but it's the commitment that the board made uh, on the, you know, the recommendation of the staff. And you know, Mike is also takes care of uh, some of the landscaping here at this building. And uh, you know, we had to cut back a little bit last year, but. Uh, I just wanted to say that, that it's, you know, talented people, but you've got to make the commitment of resources as well. And I appreciate that we've done that because I get a lot of positive comments from a lot of the people that Mike was just talking about from out of state about how well this entrance looks. Well, if, um, well, what, the exciting thing is the, the pollinator garden that's right next to the library, which was installed last year, this will be its first season. So uh, no pressure, but we certainly would love to have that contract again to make it look right. All right, any other questions for Mike or I will take a motion. No, I just wanted to say that Mike, whenever I get into any type of a conversation about climate change and you always get varying opinions one way or the other, I just like to remind people that Mother Nature does fine, just fine without humans, but humans don't do very well without Mother, Mother Nature. And uh, 
my, you know, everybody's worried about the carbons that we're putting in the atmosphere. And my concern is, is just as big for the Earth's surface itself. And I tell people, here's how I try to explain it to them. I say to them, imagine Earth being a living being, which it is, the surface of the Earth, kind of like a person is a living being. And what if I took a torch to half of your body and burned it beyond recognition? How well do you suppose your body would function after that? We are the most invasive species on the planet. Appreciate you coming on board. Glad to be here. All right, anyone want to make a motion? I make a motion to approve Mike Lociavo to the tree committee for a one year, one, one, one a position that ends April 30th, 2024. Seconded. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All of those in favor, please say aye. 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 Um, I'm going to recognize the chat here. Um, Maroney, there was a, an opportunity for public comment. Um, Zoom is created a little bit of a different scenario that allows the public to kind of throw in comments into the chat. Um, obviously, at any point in a meeting, you can speak to the topics at hand. The public session is for anything that's not on the agenda. Um, I guess I would ask, um, I'm not sure what to do here. Um, I'm trying to read it as we're going. I know um, it seems like Maroney missed the public session up at 7.03. Um, yeah, I don't know if the board wants to recognize Maroney so he can speak or um, we could speak to it um, on item D on the select board business. Well, you're looking at the you're you're looking at the uh, quest mark. Um, I think you've got better position to judge that or not than we do. Yep. It seems right. like maybe it would go well under that item on the agenda, unless time timing is an issue. If if he's not able, if Moni's not able to stay, but otherwise, it seems like that would be a good time to have that conversation. Moni, can you stick around and speak to what you? In I can, honesty. yes, first of all, I apologize. I didn't know this was already on the agenda. I, I thought I missed it. I noticed the uh, public comment was already only five minutes and I thought that, you know, um, so I'm, I'm happy to stay on. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, we've been trying to make sure the public's aware that they can speak um, during any item, not just the public section. So um, we will go to you when we get to item D. Um, but right now we're gonna go to item B, which is the amount of property tax interest to be charged on May 1st. Yeah, so I apologize, this is on here again. Uh, a couple of meetings ago, um, we brought to you the fact that, you know, interest was ready to go. There was a motion made back in November. We had a long discussion about it and ultimately uh, the board decided that we would Kind of turn on the accrual switch for interest on April 1st and it would be posted to bills that go out to delinquent taxpayers on May 1st. I thought I heard someone, Mark in particular, suggest that it should be 1% given that it's, uh, you know, uh, difficult. He asked how, how much more delinquent taxes are outstanding and I gave that report a couple of weeks ago. It hasn't changed much. Um, but ultimately, we even went back and listened to the, uh, to the meeting, and the motion just said, start the accrual of interest on April 1st, and, and the first bill goes out on May 1st, but we didn't decide whether it was 1% or 1.5%. The normal thing that happens is when the taxes are due in November, uh, if they're late, 1% <laughs> is added in uh, the day after there. Do 
and another 1% interest is charged on December 1st, and then beginning on January 1st of the following year, goes to 1.5%. Um, we've waived it for a long time, so um, the board really needs to decide whether it's 1% or 1.5%. Anyone have a thought on that? Go ahead, Mike. I would just say the only thing I would lean toward 1% for the fact that these are still tough times and it's just another thing we can do to help. Anyone else? I, I feel the same way. I, I support that. Katie? Um, anyone have an opinion otherwise? Or I think is the board okay with 1%? Yeah, you need to, somebody needs to make a motion because it is the, the official decision. I make a motion to approve that property tax interest to be charged on May 3rd. First to be a one percent. Second. All those in favor? Please, oh, or any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Sorry, I was I was muted. Um Discussion of item C is discussion of interim bylaws, public hearing to be held April 26 at 7 p.m. Uh, the reason we added this to the agenda was that um, we kind of were presented the interim bylaws at the last meeting, and I don't think a lot of the board had an opportunity to go through. Um, and we were gonna give an opportunity for the board to discuss. We can't, we've already publicly warned the, the right, the reg, so, we can't make any changes this evening, but it's more discussion on anything that we felt uh, we might be willing to talk about beforehand. So um, I don't know, I'm not sure exactly yeah. how to approach this. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, it was really a chance for the select board to, uh, as you say, you know, have a couple of weeks to read it over. If there were any questions or concerns, uh, Steve is here with us. Steve did most of the drafting of the of the interim bylaw. Uh, the planning commission did weigh in. So this is just an opportunity for the select board to ask a few questions or get some clarification so that when the public hearing comes up that you're kind of fully informed about it. Uh, someone did ask if it was uh, actually legal to talk about this before the public hearing. Uh, I did reach out to David Rue, the attorney at Schitzel, Page and Fletcher, who's been helping Steve with this. And uh, he said exactly what Mark just said. Uh, you can freely talk about this, uh, discuss it amongst yourself, ask questions of Steve. You just can't make any changes what's been warned. So, um, you're free to have at it. Steve is here with us tonight um, from home, I think. Yep, and, here. Uh, uh, go ahead. Okay. So um, as um, has been said, we have the public hearing. Warren, can everybody hear me okay? I'm usually on your meetings from, from work, but we do have good Wi-Fi here. So um, I think what I would suggest is um, next Monday at the public hearing, I'll do a more thorough walkthrough of the bylaws for uh, both the select board and the public. Um, and, you know, there'll be plenty of opportunities to um, provide um, detailed questions at that point. Um, I think where we left off when we had a discussion uh, about this, when you decided to warn the public hearing is um, a couple of the areas where the planning commission did some work on the draft subsequent to the, um, the earlier draft that went to a public hearing back in February. And um, that has to do with the, the thresholds for size for various uses uh, when they're uh, 
when it goes from a, a permitted use, which just requires site plan review to a conditional use, which requires both uh, permitted and, and uh, conditional use review by the Development Review Board. So I think that's one issue. Uh, we have three uses where the Planning Commission is recommending uh, putting an upper limit on size of the use uh, just in this downtown zoning district, the proposed downtown zoning district. And those are uh, food and beverage manufacturing, which includes um, uh, breweries. Uh, and they're recommending an upper limit of, um, of 4,000 square feet for, that, for those uses in this district, uh, that light industry, and then a specialty school, which is a, uh, basically a, a private school. So uh, the other aspect which we touched on uh, earlier has to do with uh, the maximum uh, building footprint and uh, this is a dimensional requirement. And uh, I can also share the screen if that's helpful, if there are particular areas that uh, you have questions about after, um, after going through, but um, they are recommending a, uh, a maximum building footprint size. So we can talk, uh, talk a bit about that as well. I think it's at 5,000 square feet. We can take, take a look uh, and I can provide you some more comment. They've done quite a bit of analysis of uh, existing buildings in this area. So, um, and I, I wanted to reiterate to the board that um, when you have your public hearing next week and take public comment and, uh, and have a chance to review any comment that's written, uh, sent by email or, or in writing, you can make substantive changes to this draft before you adopt it. Um, that, that is allowable under state statute. It's different than permanent bylaws where uh, when you hold your public hearing, if you have substantive changes, there has to be a, a second or subsequent public hearing on a revised draft. But the interim bylaws uh, process is meant to be expedited. So uh, it is appropriate to talk about, um, you know, aspects that, um, that you might be interested in, uh, in making changes in at some point. So, um, I think with that, Mark, I'd just as soon let the select board guide um, guide this. If it'd be helpful, I can uh, try a screen share with the draft itself if there are particular places that you'd like to take a look. Yeah, I think the screen share would be fine. I actually believe I might have a conflict. So I think I need to recuse myself from discussion and become a member of the public um, for this portion of the meeting. So Chris, if you could. Take it away. Okay. Sure. Does anybody have any questions there pertaining to the uh, interim zoning regs at this time? I, <clears throat> I have questions um, about the most recent email we got um, from, I think, the group that Mark is. Was I just talking? Yeah, I can hear you. We can okay. hear you. Um, uh, do I ask those questions now or at that public meeting just for clarification on um, some of their changes? Ask now if you want. Okay. Um, so can I have an example of what food and beverage in close place is 10,000 square feet just so I have like a reference? Uh, sure. So um, the Alchemist Brewery on Crossroad is approximately a 10,000 square foot facility. Um, so that was uh, allowed in there as a, actually a light industrial use back uh, when they moved out of the downtown uh, after Tropical Storm Irene. So that gives you an idea of the scale there. The, um, did you want any other examples? Katie? No. Mark, how, 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 Mark, how large is the footprint of your building on uh, Boundary Street or Goodwill Lane. I think it's eleven and a half thousand, or maybe just over eleven thousand square feet. So you know which building that is, Katie, the one that uh, where PK is. Yeah. So the whole building, including Fisher, or just the PK portion? No, the, no, the whole building. When I and when I say eleven thousand square feet, that might include the upstairs, which is a thousand. So maybe the footprint itself of that building is right around ten thousand square feet. Okay. And then another question I had 
in that same email they talked about a stone shed is where is that is that near like charlie o'brien's place or what the end of foundry street okay behind the methodist church okay yeah that's uh 40 foundry or 35 foundry excuse me and um it's a little over 12,000 square feet in footprint. Okay. And then maybe Mark, this is directed towards you. Um, so what's being proposed, I believe is the 5,000 square feet and what your group suggested was bumping that up to 10, but possibly settling for eight. Um, do, is there like a specific reason why you would settle for eight or why you're pushing for 10? Yeah, I think it's not necessarily pushing as much as concern of back to what we were talking about earlier in the meeting um, with some of the interviews of enticing development in the right parts of town and trying to create density where it's needed. And I think the sizing that you know, was originally put before us that Steve had proposed before the planning commission took it was 10,000 square feet. I think one of the questions I was going to have as a public member tonight was, is there a scenario that works just like permitted versus conditional that you could create a permitted up to 5,000, but conditional up to 10? I think there are ways that a, a larger building could look smaller on the streetscape, but still allow for that sizing and scale that, um, you know, could entice some developers to be interested in doing some large, hopefully residential projects downtown. I think the stone shed has been one that I have been interested in. I know the group, the WADC and others have talked about as a potential opportunity. I know there was talk years ago about the Stanley of Watson halls and opportunities. I know those just got leveled or maybe one of them got leveled, but um, you know, there's, there's a certain size and scale that's gonna entice someone to maybe take on those projects and I think our concern is that without allowing that size we might never see those projects come to fruition that would get a developer to want to build a significant amount of units that we need to help with the demand issues that we have I mean those units up on Blush Hill that was 60 units those were rented almost immediately and still people can't find housing so I remember years ago, there was other apartment owners in meetings concerned about those units going up and it's not even close to what we need to, to address the demand for housing. And that's causing prices to become unaffordable in, in my opinion. And I think the WAD, WADC's opinion as well. So I think, I think scale is really important and I understand the planning commission's concern on scale and size and streetscape, but I think that 5,000 is just too small. So Mark, maybe before we move on to um, further questions, I could just uh, speak to the um, dimensional requirement and permitted versus conditional use. Um, I think we have to deal with scale of uses in in the uh, use table and in the definitions, and I can move to that in just a minute. Um, I don't think we can apply um, a standard of, uh, of permitted versus conditional use to, to this dimensional standard. It, it needs to be an upper limit. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is that <clears throat> this entire uh, downtown zoning district is within the design review or downtown design review overlay district. So there are, there are um, standards of review within that overlay, which deals with issues such as character of the area, um, compatibility with adjacent buildings and, and this type of thing. So there, there are design criteria that the development review board uh, is, is required to apply to, uh, to new buildings or buildings that are are renovated or where there's a, um, you know, a change in the facade of the building, that, that type of thing. And there are criteria that deal with historic uh, structures in particular as well. So I just wanted to, to explain that aspect. But certainly within, within all of the uses, uh, it, it definitely is appropriate to have uh, what I call a threshold 
for uh, permitted versus conditional use, where conditional use would also deal with character of the area and uh, the, the criteria that are within that. Well, Mark, I wanted to uh, take a second and uh, try to get some clarification here on, on uh, I know there's been concerns in the past, whether it's Jason Wolf or who it was that uh, suggested that, you know, when we talked about raising the footprint square footage, maybe to four or even 5,000, uh, I made a comment about, uh, you know, my concern of allowing perhaps too big of a footprint uh, for fear of, you know, no process that you can go through to weed out possible adverse impacts when you get above a certain square footage. And that's where I thought the conditional use part would come in handy, but somebody said that made the statement that uh, that that extra step conditional use may scare a potential developer away. Um, number one, I kind of wanted to know where Steve and the Planning Commission, you know, what was the reasoning for landing on 5,000 square feet? And to your point, um, and I understand your point uh, of the 10,000 or 8,000 square foot. Um, how, how can we meet in the middle on some kind of a process that um, allows, you know, allows a bigger footprint, but with some form of uh, perhaps better secure um, understanding that the impacts will stay uh, at a lower level, I guess, not in, not occur. I mean, how, how do, I'm just looking for a solution here to, like I said before, back at the other meeting, I said, just be wary of how much you give because once you give, it's difficult to take back. Uh, and I still think that holds true, but yet I understand exactly what you're saying, Mark. So what's the right answer, I guess, I'm asking. Chris, I'll just speak briefly to the uh, review process. Um, I think most people in the development community who are uh, involved with even larger housing projects are very accustomed to conditional use review. And, and it's it's, it's not designed to prevent development in any way. It's really designed to provide opportunities to condition that development so that it's appropriate and that it, is, uh, it works well with the, uh, the surrounding area and with the community services that provide it. So I, I don't think we need to shy away from uh, the conditional use process. Um, in terms of uh, <clears throat> where this figure came from, um, I did an analysis of all of the commercial buildings in this proposed downtown zoning district. And uh, the average size is about, uh, for the footprint is about 3,200 square feet. Uh, however, there are, um, there are three buildings that are over 10,000 square feet. Um, and there's the shopping center, which is about, uh, I think over 30,000 square feet. So we definitely have larger, uh, larger buildings. Um, and uh, we don't have a lot of larger lots, the Stone Shed lot, the um, Palmer Lowe's, uh, the Waterbury Square Shopping Center, those are two of the larger lots, and the 51 South Main Street, which is about 0.8 acres. So there are definitely some larger lots, but most of the lots are relatively small. So I think there are some things working in our favor to keep the scale, but that wouldn't prevent someone from uh, purchasing Two or three lots and combining them, perhaps, and and putting a larger a larger building on, but um, but the planning commission was is definitely concerned about scale, and that's um, that's where this uh, this figure came in. Um, and um, I'd put ten thousand square feet with a question mark for discussion purposes with the planning commission, uh, but I think at some point. Um, you know, some type of um, reasonable compromise is, is fine. And these bylaws are, they're good for two years and then they can be extended for a year. And so um, when they become part of a permanent bylaw, 
proposal, which I hope will be in the next phase that the Planning Commission will work on, we can all we can change any of these um, requirements. Um, you know, we we probably want to be careful about that, uh, especially reducing the size of something that's been figured out. But um, there will be opportunities since these are interim to um, learn from our experience and, and make some adjustments as we move forward. Were there any other aspects that uh, select board members or others wanted to focus on? I can, um, if you wanted to look specifically at any of the uses, um, I know Mark, you brought up uh, the question about the uh, limit on uh, upper limit on the um, food and beverage manufacturing and light industry. And I don't know if, um, you know, if you wanted to take a look at that or if there are other issues that uh, people wanted to speak to. I mean, yeah. there were there were a few other minor comments there on the on the the letter that was sent by the uh, Waterbury Area Development um, Committee regards to the the bylaws i don't know if any board members want to bring that up or those yeah i would like to um speak to one in particular um it's the uh, section 1602 applicability um which reads all uses not specifically allowed in the downtown zoning district under this interim bylaws are specifically prohibited and no select board review is available and so on and I wonder if we are creating a future situation like we're in right now, where we're not conceptualizing things that might come up in the future um, and you know, really closing doors when it seems like maybe we can reword. And the um, uh, WDAC, is that the group, um, had some proposed language. And I know we're not making changes today, but um, I'm just curious if there's a reason behind that uh, really prohibitive language and if there's room for um you know helping us not get in the same situation we're in right now yeah danny perhaps if i could speak to that um <clears throat> we got um help from our attorney uh dave rue the one uh, attorney that bill mentioned who advises us on land use lies with the firm sitzel page and fletcher and he's a specialist in land use law so uh dave rue helped uh, me and the Planning Commission uh, work on both the uh, the purpose uh, clause right right here and the applicability. So, uh, if I could just uh, speak to the applicability, um, the state statute um, for interim bylaws allows the select board to. Um, allow uses that are um, are expressly prohibited or, or are not allowed, let's put it that way, that's a better way to phrase it. Um, the select board has the authority to, to choose, if you will, under the interim bylaw statute to allow uses um, that aren't uh, specifically allowed under the interim bylaw. So, um, what this does is uh, it limits the select board's authority under uh, that enabling statute and um, it treats the uses allowed under interim bylaw like any uses in, a, in the regular zoning regulations. So um, someone couldn't come in, for instance, and propose um, something, some general industry use or something in the downtown district that's not specifically allowed. So uh, there's still all the same rights of appeal and everything under that there, there is under any uh, permanent bylaw. If, the, um, if an applicant doesn't agree with the zoning administrator's determination, they can appeal that to the development review board. But basically this puts all of the review authority for, for projects in the hands of the development review board. Otherwise, uh, projects could essentially bypass the development review board and go directly to the select board. So it, it could really uh, politicize, if you will, the development review process in this district. So our, um, our attorney recommended that we, um, we pray some 
place some limits. Otherwise, the, the, the enabling statute rules and, um, and it gives the select board a, a, a wide uh, berth or a wide uh, range of authority in that case. So that's why this language is here and why the Planning Commission spent quite a bit of time on it. And it was specific, this is specifically where we came out with the with the attorney. I would not recommend changing it, but that's where I'm at. And um, yeah, if I may, I, I think also, um, and Danny, you, you came on to the select board um, kind of in the middle of this whole process. <laughs> but one of the things that that staff recommended and the select board agreed to was that, um, you know, it's much more preferable in my mind, and I think in Steve's mind, um, to handle development through a regulation, through a zoning regulation, uh, as often as possible, as opposed to through just negotiation with the select board. And we kind of, crossed that bridge because when uh, Perry Hill Partners appealed the, the decision of the DRB, uh, they've appealed that to court and the law allows the select board to, uh, to settle lawsuits. Uh, so there's a situation that the select board could negotiate with the developer and uh, come up with a solution uh, based on whatever the negotiation is like between the developer and the board. And uh, I think it's best that rather than settle that particular issue through a negotiation of a, of a lawsuit, that it be handled, we hope, through this interim bylaw. And uh, you know, we're going to talk about the lawsuit in a minute. But uh, I think self limiting the select board to say, we're taking an active role. We're, we're addressing some of these issues through the interim bylaw, but then let the bylaw work as a bylaw and let the, the, the development review board have its say. Um, I think it's a pretty slippery slope if you end up taking that language out and just letting the select board for a two year period, just kind of whoever comes in to, to say, oh, well, maybe we'll allow that. Uh, it should, the, the development community, in my opinion, should kind of have an idea what the community's expectations are for uses in a district. And I think that this is kind of, uh, uh, you know, splits the issue between the overly restrictive, long time antiquated bylaw that is permanent now, uh, replace it with this interim bylaw, and then let the Planning Commission come up with a new bylaw for you know two or three years down the road. So I would recommend leaving this language in as well. So for clarification, this this can and likely will change when there's permanent bylaws in two or three years. Correct. Yeah, the, yeah the, these will expire, and um, our hope they is that they won't necessarily change. I mean, the Planning right. Commission could adopt this exact language as the permanent bylaw, the, the interim bylaw has a shelf life of up to three years. It's two years with the ability to, uh, to extend it for a one year period. And then at that point, uh, a permanent bylaw has to be in place. So, um, you know, the, it doesn't have to be different than this in two years. It, this could be the bylaw that gets adopted in two years. I just, just wanted to make other one other quick point, and that is that under permanent bylaws, the select board does not have the authority to right. allow projects that are not specifically allowed in the bylaws. So this is something unique to interim bylaws and the enabling statute, which is more to address kind of emergency or very pressing issues. Steve, I don't know if we, we still need this um, screenshot up or if everybody's good with it, we can pull it down and um, yeah so good Chris uh, did anybody have any other specific questions or places that you want to look or shall I just end the screen share and you can move on Mark Mark's got a question go ahead Mark. yeah I mean obviously I, I recuse myself because I'm I'm in a tough position here as a building owner in this 
size and um, what's happening to my building at 40 Foundry is that I am going to be included in this new map and so this rule book will pertain to my building and, and what I'm struggling with is these size limitations on um, different you know where most of the uses have a permitted and conditional there are a couple uses which I happen to have in my building that have a size limitation um, where you can't even conditionally go larger and so for example I have a brewery that's about to sign a lease to go into 2,500 square feet my building is let's say it's about 10,000 square 10.5 10, in footprint they can't grow bigger than 4,000 in my building. Now, two breweries could be right next to each other, both being 4,000, but for some reason, what's being proposed is has a limitation that only allows you to grow as an individual business to 4,000. So I don't see why we created upper limits on these two. I think there's just two of them, or I'm not sure. There might be a third one. Um, I just think it should go to conditional and allow uh, someone who wants to go into a space like my building or I don't know if the stone shed's even usable. It's probably a knockdown, but I, you know, personally for me, I have to protect my interest in my building and my potential new tenant who right now under the current rule book for my building would allow them to grow into the entire space, which is what I presented to them before seeing this now ceiling on sizing. So I really want to see that changed. I, I, I also think that I've been working for a long time on trying to see larger residential projects in the downtown. And if you get on Google Maps and you look at the size of the building I'm talking about at 40 Foundry, I mean, we, years ago, we let a grocery store that's, what's that, 20,000 square feet with an additional 10,000 square feet in the downtown. And now we're trying to limit it to five. I just think it's too small. It's not going to get what we, it's not going to get the momentum to try to get more housing projects at a larger scale. Every time you build more walls, it gets more expensive. You need those shared walls to entice developers to come and do projects that we truly need in the downtown. Or what you're gonna end up seeing is maybe the demand forces the sprawl up other roads like Perry Hill, where I really think that we should focus on trying to entice some projects in the downtown. And, and a 5,000 square foot, I think is just too small. So those are my two major ones. I, I feel terrible that this brewery could end up finding out, or they might not even sign the lease. I mean, I already warned him that this might happen, but um, you know, I just don't think that rule makes sense. And I'm just an I'm an outlier in this problem, but it's a real problem for my investment in that building there. And and I want to see that that just goes to. Uh, you know, just a conditional, just like a restaurant, you can have any size apparently, but you can't have a brewery any size in the downtown. And yeah. I think, go ahead. You know, I just, uh, back at that, one of the prior meetings there, I think I had expressed my opinion that I was okay with, um, you know, setting a, maybe a 5,000 square foot limit, four or 5,000 square foot, but having the ability to upsize into, you know, 6,000 to 8,000 to 10,000 through a conditional use um, process, uh, which would then, you know, depending on the business, would take a look at those adverse impacts, if any, uh, and try to address them so that to, to keep them to a minimum. Um, I'm certainly not against scaling up um, if, if, uh, as long as it doesn't, you know, adversely impact the the neighboring buildings and and uh, in the downtown as a whole. I mean, I I think what you're talking about, Mark. You know, I'm no brewer by any stretch, but uh, any breweries that I drive by uh, don't seem to <laughs> be making a lot of racket. You know, um, so I I think that's something that we could consider at some point. Um, Maybe when the public uh, meeting comes around, we can talk a little bit more in depth about it. Um, but I just wanted to jump back real quick to a comment made about um, Black Board intervening and changing rules at whim, uh, overriding the the, the uh, planning commission's 
bylaws, I think two things. I mean, if you started down that path, I think you'd be hard pressed to find people to volunteer for the planning commission because what difference would it make? You went in and worked your butt off to try to make a set of rules and every time you turn around, the select board overruled what you were doing and just our blanche did whatever they wanted. I think you'd have a hard time. Um, and the, you also would kind of miss out on the, uh, the collaborative process with the public. Um, you know, I know it's hard to get the public to show up to anything, but uh, uh, at least they have the option to do that through the process that we currently have. Um, so, and I just, I, I think you'd set a bad precedence uh, and, and, you know, you'd start to have select board members uh, be called self-serving and uh, and maybe some people would get on the board for that for that purpose you know so I agree with Bill and Steve both I don't think we should walk that path but uh, I think there's there's solutions to your concerns Mark uh, and still and still maintain a expeditious process you know uh, so that's that's what I want. Those are the comments I wanted to make. I yeah, just want to quickly clarify. Oh, sorry, Danny. oh no, I'm sorry. I just want to clarify, Chris, because I just don't. Uh, my question was um, maybe misunderstood. Just the I don't know the process as well as a lot of people being new, so I didn't understand that that wording implied that that any appeal or review went to DRB. I thought it implied that there was no appeal or review, and if it wasn't included in this um, bylaws, then zero no chance so um bill and steve clarified that 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 the review is by the drb and not the select board so i was by no means suggesting that the select board should have um you know that kind of like overarching power or anything like that no i i, I don't didn't expect you were that you were uh suggesting that but i think steve was stating that the the legislative body at the state house gave the authorization mm -hmm. for the select board to in fact overrule uh, if in an interim situation, if they if they so choose, is that correct, Steve? Yeah, that that's correct, Chris. That option is there, unless we have language that doesn't allow it. Right. That's correct. Okay. Marcus, go ahead. Steve, what's the current building limit size downtown? Right now, we don't have any limit on footprint, Mark. This is a new requirement. It's something that. Um, when the unified development bylaw draft was was draft was put together back in 2018, it's something that the consultant recommended for um, different districts, and um, you know it's meant to limit like a big box phenomena in a certain district where you may not want a big box store or something like that in a certain district. So so that's really the purpose to limit scale, but um, you know it's it's a figure where where you can you can put a limit that you feel is appropriate. That, that's fine, just like on these uses. I just wanted to make one quick point here. Um, these two uses in particular under industrial, the food and beverage manufacturing and light industry, um, I would recommend that they stay conditional use at any, um, any size because these uses can have some adverse impacts in terms of noise, uh, fumes, things of that nature, where it's really beneficial when conditions can be placed on a permit just to um, mitigate the uh, impacts of those uses. So I, I just wanted, but this this upper limit could certainly be adjusted to something that you feel is appropriate, that's fine. Yeah, and again, I'll reference the, the difficulties we had with uh, the, the growing of the alchemist up there on uh, the crossroad. Um, the neighbors, I mean, that whole thing was hell for a while, wasn't it, Steve? Yeah, there have been issues. Uh, and that's really where these conflicts come in is where you have adjacent residential areas. And that's where um, the, the DRB review under conditional use is, is very important. Um, you know, we're fortunate on Foundry Street that currently that's in our industrial district. And the proposal is to incorporate into the downtown zoning district. But we're, we're fortunate that we don't have too many nearby residential areas there, though we do have a church and, and so on. So we can certainly have some further discussion about this whole topic, that's fine. Okay. Um, 
Okay. Is there anybody else? It's Mike. First of all, I want to publicly commend the Planning Commission, Steve, Ken, for really taking a leadership role uh, on this issue. I know this was, it started off fairly contentious, and I know I had some questions, and I think we worked through this in a very collaborative way. Uh, I think it's really important. I think we want, we're wounding, we're getting a better product. I do want to hear what the pub, what the public, I know Mark had some comments. My, my biggest concern was some of the size restrictions, which I think the uh, planning commission dealt with in a very good way. I think also the interim bylaws gives us a kind of, as they say, it's interim, you know, this is something, let's look at growing in a, a smart way. You know, if, if that's not going to meet the needs of the community, maybe when we come to a permanent bylaw, we're going to come up to a different solution. So I just want to say thanks to the Planning Commission. Thanks, Steve, for all that you've done. I think we have a much better product. I'm anxious to hear what the public says uh, next week and... You know, from there, we'll, we'll all make a decision. That's it. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> You're welcome. Any, anything else from anybody? If, if not, we can close this agenda item out and uh, I'll let Mark take back over and move on. Like everybody's good. Okay, thank, thank you. Thanks, Steve. Sure, you're very welcome. Okay, Mark, it's all yours. Thank you. Uh, this is moving on to item D for select board business uh, update on racial equity training. Um, Bill, do you want to start and then I can chime in and then I know Maroney would like to speak, but um, yeah, Bill, if you could. Yeah, sure. Um, actually, it was Danny, I believe, who requested this item beyond the uh, agenda. Danny uh, came to meet with me a week or so ago. Uh, you know, after the last select board meeting, I kind of gave her an update as to where we were with this issue as far as training uh, is concerned. Um, I think she's done a little bit of research. I actually did try to call uh, the Vermont Partnership for Fairness and Diversity uh, on Friday. It was late in the day, and uh, I just got a voicemail and because it was so late in the day, I didn't leave a message. I knew that Danny might want to talk about this. So I didn't want to kind of uh, tread on her toes, so to speak. So uh, with that, you know, this is an issue that the select board has talked about a couple of different times. We've looked at a couple of different options and here we are, we haven't really done much yet. So Danny, why don't you take it from there? Sure thing. Um, so I, know that originally Mark had um, tried to work with the Human Rights uh, Commission and um, did pursue for quite a while and, and was essentially ghosted by them and didn't get a response. So um, I picked up and um, I had a resource, resource that I found uh, real. It's race, equity, and leadership trainings, which offers training specifically for municipal staff and elected officials. And the other is the Vermont Partnerships for Fairness and Diversity, which Bill referenced. Um, and that came from a woman, uh, Mary, I believe it's Gannon, but I'm unsure um, that Maroney had um, introduced me to because she was doing training for um, the select board in Brattleboro. And just today I received um, some, some other uh, information from Mary, Bill, which I'll pass along to you. Um, so what I had asked for Bill to do is look into those two resources that seemed very promising. Um, with the hope that we could get something on the books for the select board and potentially um, some town staff, maybe department heads uh, by the by early summer, knowing that we're sort of at the mercy of, of what they've got available. Um, and then my hope was that we could at least have something in the calendar to report back to the public for our first May meeting on May 3rd. Um, so that is the update and um, Hopefully we'll have more to report to the public um, in that May meeting.
and I, I believe we talked about this being outside of a standard select board meeting to make sure we can focus on it and find the time. Yeah, like like you said, I was talking with someone at I believe the Human Rights Council, and they were talking about February dates, and we're going to get back to me, and then I heard nothing because um, I even talked to the select board about the previous select board um, about trying to pick some dates that worked, and then I couldn't get a hold of anyone. So um, apologies for the delay. Um, I, I really do want to see this happen. I think we all do, um, but it, there's just some logistics of timing, but thank you, Danny, for following up on it, and hopefully we can get this on the books and, and go through the training. Hey, do you or Maroney um, know um, the, the training that other communities have had? Has it been a, you know, a one, you know, one session um, training one and done kind of thing or is this something that has you know stretches over a course of weeks or months do, do either one of you know what's been going on with that so Maroni just forwarded me something from Mary that I have not read because it was just this evening and it might be in there um, I'm scanning it right now it looks like there's a uh, select board members three two hour sessions um is an option or a one two hour session so it looks like there are a couple of options um but i i haven't read it in detail so i'll pass that on to you right. um bill if i may jump in from um my conversation with mary um the model that they have uh is more of an ongoing not just a one time and done thing. It's an ongoing and looking at different angles of the system. So, okay. but uh, it might have more details than what I said. I forward to you, Danny. But. Uh, okay, Maroni or Danny, do you have a direct uh, contact for her? Uh, I tried to call the Vermont Partnership for Fairness and Diversity, which is, I believe, where she works, and. Um, you know, that's, it's not a very user-friendly voice messaging system. Uh, the only one that I could find was the executive director. Maybe you have to go through the executive director, but if you have a, a, a direct contact, it might be easier for me to get some information. Yes, I, I do have direct contact and I will definitely follow up with you and connect you too. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Do we know of any other towns that we could just reach out to that are doing these types of trainings that maybe we could get contact through them as well? That's where this one came from. I think it was Brattleboro, but I don't know um, of others, yeah, but I could I'm, ask around. I'm not aware of any. I'm sure there plenty have done it, but I, I don't know who. <laughs> I know that the um, Harwood Union School Board also goes through sensitivity training. I think they recently had one, so I could possibly reach out to them as well, one of our representatives, see who they go through too. Yeah, if you do, Katie, just get me the contact information directly, please. Yeah, I know I, I mentioned uh, several months ago, you know, I've been through diversity training when I was with. Uh, uh, USDA and they have some pretty good diversity training. The problem is now with the pandemic, you know, a lot of that's all limited to, you know, federal, federal employees. So it's not as widespread. So I thought that would be a good way to do something because the training was excellent, but you know, it, it is I wish it was easier to get some of this training, but sometimes it's it's a little difficult and we just need to roll up our sleeves and figure out how to accomplish it. Okay, but it sounds like, Bill, you are going to help coordinate this for us. That would be great because I think it's hard for us on an individual basis to do it. Um, but then the board members will just have, I'm assuming, is this day or evening training or do we need to wait and find out? Or find out. We'll, I'll find out what's available, Mike. Um, is, the, is the preference to the board evening? Yes, absolutely. I would, I would assume that would be the case. So, 
Um, any other public comment on this before we move on? Okay. Um, we are going to move on to consider local emergency management plan bar bar. Oh, excuse me. I'm oh, sorry. I, I thought sorry. that I thought that Katie had added um, an item right oh, after this. You're right. That was um, all right. Pretty input. It's sort of related to the racial equity training, but it's a little bit different. Yep. Yeah. Sorry. I apologize. I'm working off of a printed PDF, and I forgot to add that. So, um, Katie, and I I guess I wondered if I could go first. I did check with Maroney. He said that would be okay. Yeah, sure. Go ahead, Amy. So, yeah, because I had reached out, um, and, and Katie was very responsive and put this on the agenda. Um, and so I, I need to start out by saying to Chris, you know, I've, in my experiences with you, um, my personal experiences, we've always had, you know, a you know, really positive exchange. And my husband and I always appreciated the work you did. And, um, you know, you really, you helped me out in a few situations and were really patient talking through stuff and you were very knowledgeable. And so this isn't personal. And I, you know, so, you know, appreciated my exchanges with you. Um, and my sense is that you bring a lot of value to the select board um, in terms of uh, your perspective as a businessman, and um, and I, you know, I like your focus of trying to keep Waterbury an affordable place. Um, but I, I was, um, I, I found it, you know, really disconcerting when all of the, the stuff came up around race um, related to comments you made in the fall, and um, it was really painful to follow the stuff on Front Porch Forum. And I felt like it was it was just so um, disappointing to see our community get so divided. Um, and you know, when I read the article in Waterbury um, Waterbury Roundabout, where you all came to a resolution where um, Chris, you agreed to step down as chair but stay on the board. And I just was really encouraged by that because I thought, well, you know, great. You know, there are a lot of people who are really glad you're on the board and you bring value to the board. Um, but, you know, there were, you know, enough concerns about the comments, whether or not they were taken out of context and, and misinterpreted. It just seems like the racial issues are, are so heated now, you know, across the country and, in our state and in our community, there's things going on in our schools and um, and things that I've heard about, you know, in nearby towns. Um, so it's certainly, you know, an issue that's not going away. Um, and I was just really encouraged to hear that it, you know, it seemed like you were interested in in learning and you were sort of happy to, um, you know, compromise in this situation where, you know the whole select board would get this training. Um, and then I guess, you know, at a certain point, yeah, you know, it would be revisited as to, um, you know, you're, you know, taking a position of leadership again. Um, but I guess since, you know, I heard that you were vice chair and it seems like, um, so now you're back in a position of leadership where um, it didn't seem like any racial equity training had happened. And I don't know if there's any other, um, <laughs> You know, sort of individual education the board members have been getting on their own. Um, but, you know, it's also apparent that whenever the chair has to recuse himself, then you assume the position as chair. And so we're kind of back in the same position. And I thought that, um, I, you know, I guess I was just really encouraged to see um, the training happen and then some, you know, movement in a positive direction on this. And, um, and I guess I really would just love to see our community working together on this. It's just, it's really hard to see um, everyone get so divided and take sides. So I just think it would be great. I don't know if it's, uh, you know, easy for, for you guys to just, you know, take another vote and have somebody else be vice chair for, for now. And then, um, 
have the training and then, um, you know, it's really, I've been doing this work for a while with, with a couple of groups and it, it's really tricky stuff. And, um, and the more I get into it, the more I, the more I learn. And there's like just so many different perspectives and, and pieces of it. Um, it's not that easy. Um, but I just think, you know, communication is a big piece of it. And so if your words were taken out of context, that's also part of it. Like you have, like, I've just noticed myself having to um, pause before I say something having to do with race, because it's, it's, it's so easy to, to say something that, that doesn't come across right to certain people, but people are going to make mistakes. And um, I think it's just a matter of, um, you know, having the education and learning how to move forward on this. So, um, so if it's something, you know, the board can consider, um, I would, I would just appreciate that. And um, I'll just turn it over to the, the next person who wants to speak. Thanks, Amy. Um, anyone else want to follow Amy up? It looks like Alexia. Go ahead, Alexia. Hi, uh, my name is Alexia Vanafra. This is the first select board meeting that I have ever attended live. I have uh, watched many of them uh, in, the, in the last uh, 10 months or so. Um, First, I just want to say kind of as a plug for I don't know what you're planning to do as far as Zoom once, you know, things quote unquote go back to normal, but I really, really hope that you continue to allow attendance from home because boy, does it make it more accessible for a lot of us who have little kids and other reasons not to want to go out into the snow or whatever, what have you. Um, so just wanted to put that plug in. Um, I guess I wanted to see, I was, I was just curious when Katie added this, was it for the purpose of having the public comment or I didn't like, I think I, we went straight to public comment and I guess I was hoping that this agenda item would be kind of introduced or grounded somehow. So I guess that's my first question. Yeah, so I had initially added it um, kind of like to go with the discussion of the board training and to see where we were with that because I had received correspondence um, from two parties, Amy being one of them, about where we were with the racial training schedule um, and about the discussion about the vice chair. So that's why I added it um, in case Amy wanted to speak um, to it and anybody else. Okay, thank you for that. Um, you know, we we have uh, you we have asked uh, to have some time set on the agenda on May third, specifically around this discussion. Um, we, um, meaning uh, the WARC, the Waterbury Area Anti-Racism Coalition's outreach and engagement team, specifically I and Aaron Lander and Maureen McCracken uh, reached out to each of the board members, uh, except for Danny, because at the time uh, she wasn't really involved in uh, the discussion around um, and when the harmful statements were made uh, in the summer and in October and again in January. I guess I, I do wanna just be clear about that. What we're talking about is not a specific word um, or a specific incident, but actually kind of a pattern of, of, of harmful statements. So uh, I guess I would just ask, is this our, like, our, I, I wonder if the board could give us some, um, some idea of whether you are planning on putting some time uh, for discussion on May 3rd, because if so, I would reserve, um, you know, I would, I've posed questions that I hope that each one of you will answer. Um, Danny is certainly welcome to answer them as well. Um, my suggestion would be because I think there, you know, there, there, there's certain answer, there's certain questions they're taken apart because it really focuses on different things and different impacts. So my suggestion and my hope would be that if you add time to the May 3rd meeting about this, that you would actually answer each question separately, including each sub bullet separately. And I would be certainly happy to pose those questions or assist in any way. But I guess my question is one is, are you uh, deciding to add time to the May 3rd and also, I am curious uh, from a procedural standpoint uh, to Amy Hoskins' point, what, 
can a, a vote be retaken? Thank you. So to give you an idea on agenda items, any select board member can add an agenda item or um, sometimes bill or you know, a member of the, of the municipal staff will add an agenda item. Um, so that's the easiest way to get anything on the agenda. Um, I fully support a conversation on May 3rd. I think that's, that's totally fair and it gives it, the best thing that can happen is we warn it with that agenda item on there. It gives the public an opportunity to see that it will be discussed and gives the most opportunity for public input. Um, and then in terms of, uh, you know, Chris is vice chair, there's a, there's a bunch of different avenues. I think um, Chris could step down. We could, we could as a board vote to remove Chris as vice chair. Um, I think there's definitely a conversation. I, I received some emails with concerns on Chris um, being elected to vice chair. Um, I think historically, yeah, Maroney, I'll, I'll go to you in a sec. Um, I think historically we've seen these chair roles as uh, you know helping to facilitate a meeting, so it helps to have someone who's um, participated on the select board in previous years that can basically just run through an agenda. There are just little rules and procedures that even I, as head of the select board, struggle with. <laughs> so, um, you know, obviously Chris has been on the board the longest. Um, it's helpful to have somebody who really knows how to navigate. Um, just even just the meetings themselves. I think we learned a lot in the last year that um, positions like chair potentially have uh, more opportunities to speak and words matter and um, words can definitely create hurt and pain. And I think we um, as a board have said we are willing to learn, try to um, be better, um, definitely have tried as a board member to learn research and, and try to figure out how to bring education onto the board. And even I've um, struggled with it before Danny was on the board, she had reached out to me and I really did try to line up training and it's, it's surprisingly complicated. Um, and I really do hope that we can find a path and once that path is set, it's a regular thing that the board can participate in and we appreciate groups like work that can help us maybe navigate some of that just education and or educate us just as a group and talk about what's happening in the community and how we as a select board um, can help with the agendas that you have. So um, Maroni, I think you had your hand up next. So uh, I'll give you the floor. Well, thanks, Mark. Um, really appreciate it. I know it's uh, it's over time, so I won't take too, too much time, but to begin, I just want to thank you all um, very much for all the work that you're doing. And I know you are, this is a volunteer position. Uh, and as someone who is newly elected as the uh, uh, library commissioner who recently got my first uh, angry email from a constituent, um, I have, I'm even more appreciative of the work that you do. So sincerely, thank you. Um, I'm speaking be uh, tonight as an individual resident of Waterbury, not on behalf of the work. Uh, I'm glad to hear that work will have a conversation um, down the road with you all. Um, the last couple of weeks have been really tough. And, you know, with all the shootings going on and watching the trial of the murder of George Floyd, um, it's brought back traumatic memories of 2020, um, which including uh, what Amy has already touched on, um, what Chris, when Chris called um, for segregation, segregating the police as a solution to stop um, police killing of black and brown people. And at the time I started a petition uh, which uh, over 500 Waterbury residents signed calling on Chris to resign. Um, Chris refused to resign instead stepped down as a chair. Uh, even in his statement, he didn't recognize the harm done by his promoting segregation um, of law enforcement. Rather, he kind of played the victim and many of us were willing to live with what Chris, uh, you know, with him stepping down, knowing at the time that the select board, uh, including Chris, would commit to ongoing uh, anti-racism training. And I personally reached out to you, some of you individually, and had conversations. Uh, in our private conversation, 
you recognize that Chris not only was wrong, uh, but that his proposal of police segregation was out of touch, not to say racist. And I am curious to hear uh, about what specific action, um, you know, you have taken or Chris has taken to acknowledge and also publicly apologize for the harmful impacts of his words and action. Uh, it seems to me that without holding Chris accountable, the select board has nominated him as a vice chair. Now, I'm sure you have all of your reasons. Um, you have a reason why you did that and I'm not here to question your motive. I'm just here to let you know that I'm disappointed. Your decision was pretty much a slap in the face to me personally and to other black and brown residents of Waterbury. It was also a slap in the face to so many constituents who voted for you. And so I'm just here to let you know that even though this is not election year, um, we are still watching you. We'll continue to hold you all accountable and we will continue to be here and hopefully work with you moving forward. So thanks again for all that you do and thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Ryan. Um, do any of the board members have comments? Go ahead, Chris. I just wonder when Chris V ends, gets to defend himself in any of this. I'm not a social media guy. I'm not a computer guy. I'm just a working stiff. <clears throat> Barely made it through high school. <clears throat> I'm dyslexic. I have problems reading, I have problems understanding the English language. My math skills are great. If you read the seven days article, in the seven days article, when I made the statement, segregated part of the police department, I even stated in there, not sure if that's the right word. I'm not a professor of the English language. What I thought I was saying was a separate division of the police department of minority police officers to go into minority communities to help calm, defuse the problems, stop the killings, stop the problems, or at least mitigate them till we could find a better solution. Instead, I was called a racist. And if you watch TV at all, about a month ago, Mont State Agency of Public Safety, Vermont State Police, hired their first Somalian black police officer. I was sitting on the couch, eating my, having my coffee for the morning, watching the Channel 3 News when the interview came on. First words that came out of that officer's mouth was, I'm gonna be able to represent the people in my communities. And he went on. And if you wanna Google that conversation, do it. You'll find out that I was way ahead of the eight ball on proposing something to stop this ridiculousness that's going on in this country. I never took sides on any of this. All I tried to do was help. And because of my weakness in the language barrier, I made a mistake. But if you listened to the whole damn conversation, you'd have got the premise of it. You'd have understood what I was talking about. There was nothing, nothing racial about it. It was because I cared about what was going on and I cared the fact that people were getting killed senselessly. And I was trying to make a suggestion, stop it. Part of this was political by a, one of our elected officials here at the state house who didn't want to lose his seat. He blew it out of proportion. And to Mr. Minter's 
comments. Maroney, remember when you came to the board and you wanted the mural put up down in town? And I asked you, is there a more gentle way we can handle this? There's got to be a better way so that we don't create division, so that we don't create animosity, so we don't have vandalism. I said, can't we do something more inclusive? People of different races in the mural, in engaging each other, holding hands, embracing each other. He didn't want any part of it. But then two months later, three months later, you come to the board and you want the board, first you ask me and before I could respond to you, to put it on the agenda, you've got somebody else to put it on the agenda. And what you ended up doing was wanted a, a declaration of inclusion, accepting all people. Isn't what that, that what I was trying to do back at that particular meeting when you wanted the mural put up? Isn't that what I was trying to promote? The same thing that you managed to get the select board to adopt? You know what? Sometimes there's cultural differences. There's barriers. There's weaknesses in people. They make mistakes. We're humans. And now you people started this organization to become judge and jury of who's complying with the way you think. You know, I'm a little offended when you talk about offense. I don't mean to offend you by saying this, but the word training offends me. How about understanding instead? You know, I, and half of what the paper wrote about me, like statements, Maroney, show me in writing, show me on video where I ever said anything about black and brown people moving to this state. That's what caused the problem. Show me that and I'll resign. It was a ball face lie, along with other things that the paper printed because they're the paper, they're the media. They like to stir the thought. I'm no more racist than anybody on that board right there or anybody on this Zoom right now. I've got friends of color, people I grew up with, the minorities, who I love and enjoy and respect. And ask Noah Fishman how many times I respected, uh, disrespected his wife. I was always good to her, always cordial to her, always respected her. You people got me labeled wrong. And the fact that I was ahead of the game on a lot of these things, instead I was called a racist. And that's what I wrote to Liz Scalati. I said, Chris was right on two fronts, but was called a racist because of it. No, I was the forward thinker. You guys want my ass out? Just tell me. You can find somebody else to solve your problems. I'm sorry. I had to come out. Uh, Alexia. Alexa, before, can I say something really quick? I'm so course, sorry. That was directed, at, of course. Yes. Go ahead, Maroney. Chris, with all due respect, I don't want this. This is this is why you have made it seem like it's a between it's an issue between me and you. It's not. So please stop making it personal. I'm not. If you want to have a conversation with me personally, I will be more than happy to do that. And I have given you so many opportunities. So let's not have that do that here. Let's talk if you want to do that in private. So thank you. Uh, welcome, but, yeah. I welcome that conversation, Maroney. I, you know, I did ask you to meet with me, and you and you didn't respond. So I just figured you weren't interested. But yeah, you anytime. asked me to meet with you privately in your workshop, and I'm not mm -hmm. interested. I want to meet with you in Zoom, not in your workshop during a pandemic. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, I'm not a, I'm not a computer guy, but sure, my wife will set us up, and I I revel in the opportunity. Thank you, uh, Alexia. Um, in some ways, I think this is good because I think it's maybe it gives us some some things to to mull over um, in preparation for the May third meeting. 
um, I think it is important to, um, uh, you know, especially as, uh, as an elected official uh, to speak with respect in a tone that is respectful. Um, you know, I was tempted to call point of order. Um, so I would just hope that for next time um, that we work on our tone. Uh, the other thing, and, and by that I mean by select board members. Um, um, the other thing I wanted to talk about, uh, speaking of private conversations, I did wanna just mention, I had forgotten to, um, that our ask is a multi-pronged ask. We have invited each of the select board members uh, that we wrote to to set up a private conversation with um, uh, two of us, uh, more two of me and Maureen and Aaron, um, because I, I I would really encourage um, some of you know I would encourage you, Chris, to set up that private conversation because it's right. It's hard to do this over public, um, and I know that you are doing the best that you can with the knowledge that you have, but so much of what you said tonight is harmful and problematic. And I really, really encourage you to, um, to set that time up with us before the May 3rd meeting. I really encourage you. Um, I will talk to you with respect. I will talk to you, um, you know, from a place of curiosity, um, but you continue to make really, really harmful comments. Um, I've heard you speak about uh, your various challenges regarding your education, regarding your learning, dis your, your dyslexia, et cetera. It can't cut both ways, Chris. You cannot take on a leadership position the way that you have for as many years as you have to wield that power when it's convenient and then to fall back on um, on your challenges when, when you are being asked to help, be held accountable. If you are found a way all these years to be select board chair, to be a select board person, um, and, and now to be a select board vice chair, then you have all the tools that you need, um, assuming you have the willingness to do this work. And as somebody in power and who represents me as a citizen of this town, it is your responsibility to do so. The end around that. Um, so I just wanted to say that. And the last thing that I will leave you is I really encourage you uh, between now and May 3rd to, um, to pick up this book that's called So You Want to Talk About Race. It's available in audiobook. It's available over Kindle. It's available in print. Um, and also, while I hope that you will actually pay Joma Olu for her labor and actually purchase a copy, I, I have found a free copy on YouTube where it's an audio book where it's, it's on YouTube, but really it's a free audio version. And specifically, I would point you to chapter 16, which is, I just called racist. I just called a racist. I just got called racist. What do I do now? Okay. Because what she talks about actually is how so many of us white folk freak out about being called racist and use that as a way to be blind to the harm that we cause. So if I run over my run over your foot with my truck and you say, ow, 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 that was so hurtful. And I look at you, Chris, and I say, I didn't run over the truck. You misunderstood. Or I'm sorry, that wasn't my intention. Why are you being so sensitive? You still have a broken foot, regardless of what my intentions were and regardless of whether you, I think you deserve to have the reaction that you have. And so I really encourage you to read this chapter because I think it will bring a lot of light to why so much of what you're doing is so, so insanely dismissive of, um, of, of those who have been oppressed for hundreds of years and those over whom we have um, just, are, I'll just leave it at that, thank you. So I encourage you and I'll put this in the chat. Thanks, Alexia. Um, I do, I'm gonna, I'll say I see hands are up. I do wanna just be conscious of time because we do have other things. I think this is a very important discussion so I'm really not trying to limit discussion, but I do also want to be conscious that it's 9.30. So um, 
I, I really do want anyone to have an opportunity to speak. I think this is going to be a topic we will continue to discuss. Um, Danny, go ahead. Thanks. I will. Um, I will try to keep it brief. I think a lot of what I want to say might be better saved for a private conversation or a personal conversation. But as a as a newly elected member of the board, I don't want to sit quietly during this conversation. Um, I think Alexia was was um, really articulate with a lot of what I want to say, and um, I think uh, Chris, you you made some points about the word training and the word understanding that actually make a lot of sense. And um, when applied to what is being asked of all of us as a group, that's exactly the that's exactly the request is that we work to seek a deeper understanding of what other people are feeling. So whether we call it a training or an understanding, that's that is the ask. Um, when you when you when you um, I, this is really hard. This is really hard because I'm newly elected and I want to work really well with my board members. So I just want to acknowledge this is really hard for me and I'm and I'm trying my best as well. Um, when we talk about the words that we use not having meaning you, in one sentence, we, we said segregate, but that's not what you meant. You meant separate and the word segregate means separate. So, so it is the same. And I, I understand that you, you don't feel that way, but, um, but these trainings or these teachings to understand can help us learn how, how they do mean the same thing. And so you're really, really humble when you talk about your background and your work and your education and that humility is, is what so many people respect about you. And it's what I respect about you. And I think I'm curious if, if that humility can also go forward in this aspect. So rather than saying I'm not and I don't and I won't and you don't understand, maybe we have all of us work to do on being humble and say, if so, if so many people are not understanding my words and, and, are, and are asking me to learn, then maybe I can be more humble and learn and understand where they're coming from instead of digging in and just saying that they're wrong. So um, I, I think I'd love to talk with you more, not in a public meeting, but I just, I, I couldn't sit quietly without speaking up a little bit. Thank you, Danny. Um, Mike, go ahead. I uh, just want to say a couple of very brief comments. Um, one, I'm very disappointed that our community cannot be more respectful to each other. Uh, I think that's a cornerstone. I am disappointed that the board has not received training. I know their bill, Mark, has worked, but that hasn't happened. I would have liked to have seen it happen quicker. I am disappointed, and I'm going to say this, Alexia mentioned there was email sent out to board members. I never received an email. The only email that I have received on this issue was uh, the one that Amy sent out about uh, considering Chris's removal. That's the only email that I, I had received. Uh, so, and there was nothing about uh, having conversations with people. So if, you, if, if you're being inclusive, I don't think you, you're being inclusive because I haven't been contacted. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Um, did I see anyone else's hand up? Go ahead, Alexia. Mike, I am, oops, I'm muted. Hold on, can you hear me okay? Mike, can you hear me okay? Yes. Or all of you, can you hear me okay? Um, I am so terribly sorry. I looked up your address. I, 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 like As you were speaking, I'm looking it up right now. Uh, please forgive me. I sent from the work outreach email, I sent it to, uh, the, to, to Chris. So I guess I would ask, is there, it, so I sent this basically the same letter. It was tailored to you, to Chris, Mark, Katie, and Mike. I'm the only one that received it. And you're the only one that received and it? Mark, maybe. Uh, I, I, I was Googling it. I was checking my email and I, I can't find it. Um, oh my gosh, I am so sorry. Uh, I think we have to be careful sometimes that there's an assumption that, because this has happened on other topics, that emails are always read. Um, 
So I think sometimes it's better to ask if we actually received it um, because sometimes it's you didn't you didn't get a response because we didn't want to respond to it as we literally didn't see it. Um, so um, just keep that in mind on some of this no. stuff. But, yeah. I haven't checked my spam folder to see if it happens to go to spam. Because I said I have cpvns at Gmail. Chris, is that your correct email? Okay. I have, that's who I sent it to. I sent it to Katie. She got it. I have mark at waterberryreservoir.com, making sure I spelled it right. Um, and I sent it to michael.bard22 at gmail.com. Okay. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to send it. I'm so sorry. I'm going to send it from um, from my own personal email in case there's something weird and I will get that to you tonight. I'm really, I, I apologize. That was unintentional for sure. Another Thank plug you. for waterberry.com uh, email addresses for the book. Abs yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So my apologies. I'll take care of that. Okay. Well, um, speaking to some of the comments about point of order. I think we're learning how to navigate some of this. I, I think this is, um, you know, I've been on the board for over five years and this has been the most times I've recused myself. This is the most times that I, you know, I think navigating some of this is, it, it's not that the board doesn't want to fully participate and try to like you know i'm learning how to be a chair i've never been the chair really before and i forgot that you had you could do point of order and i don't want to cut somebody off and i and i need to learn um that and, and i have obviously a lot to learn um i think back to the comments about chris being vice chair i did have some concerns when he was nominated um but i also believe that i met with chris chris and i met for I, it was probably close to four or five hours. I don't know. It was a, it was a long time. We had a very long discussion, um, and I encouraged him to stay on the board but go through training. But I did ask him to step down as chair. Um, I think that is the best opportunity to move forward, and I think um, that training is important. And um, I really do want to see it. I I apologize obviously in the COVID world of owning three restaurants and the nightmare that is that. And so I apologize, I really did try. I actually spoke to somebody at the Human Rights um, Commission. So I, the training is obviously important to the community. It's important to the board. Um, I want to extend my apologies that it hasn't happened sooner um, to Mike's point. And I know that um, you know there's been concern that it has gone on uh, longer than it should. Um, I think we, once we have an established plan I do believe um, and I will I will personally help to try to make sure that that training continues and we don't just pigeonhole ourselves into one type of training but we also listen and learn and there might be other other ways to learn including reading um, I've already loaded the book into my Amazon shopping cart so um, again this is a very important issue I don't want anyone who's attending this meeting or not attending this meeting to not believe that um, conversations around race and equality and um, how we navigate it as a town. I think, you know, looking back to the scenario about the conversation around policing, I think we as a board, and, and I've stated this before, have to be very careful talking about things that, we're, that are not specifically under our control or on our agenda and speaking to a broader issue. I think it is very risky. It is potentially dangerous. I think we have to remember what we can do as a board and what we have control over. And I think that there are things that we're not doing that we could. So I'm not saying that we don't have the ability to make change, but I think when it comes to policing, we should talk about our contract. And if we believe that the state police are doing the right things to deal with racial inequity and if we decide they don't, then we need to talk about creating our own police force. Those kind of conversations are things that we have control over. And I think those are, um, you know, we, we are learning. We used to not even have a police force as a town. It was all under the village. That only came onto our responsibility very recently. And there was even talk about not even having one. Um, so 
uh, I've had concerns specific to police in terms of that contract and the uh, just the social experience of their interaction with the town, like a local police force versus how the state police um, might approach just lo you know just dealing with things that are outside of what the state police typically deal with. Um, so I think there are a lot of conversations to be had. Um, I personally look forward and I think that a lot of the board does too, the work that work is doing. And um, yeah, I see Bill's hand is up, so I'll go to Bill. Yeah. So at risk of being misunderstood that I don't think this is an important issue, I think it is. But to the, to the broader issue of what we're doing right now and how we conduct ourselves, if the board wants to put this issue on uh, the May 3rd meeting, that's fine. I would be remiss if I didn't remind the select board and the public that's watching that this is a select board meeting. The select board is elected to conduct the business of the town and um, interactions with your constituents. They have many opportunities to talk to you as individuals. They can call you, they can email you. And there are times when the public can bring something to your attention and we're having this discussion and it's appropriate. But I have to warn you that things like the public deciding to raise their hand and say point of order. This is not a town meeting. This is not a, a chance for the public to, to, to um, interrogate the board about how they feel about certain issues. This is supposed to be the select board conducting the business of the meeting. The town has given you a charge. They've adopted a budget. They uh, approved priorities. And we have to deal with these issues of running the town for the rest of the year. And then if the public doesn't like what the select board is doing, they don't like the progress they're making on certain things, they get to vote for a select board member. Actually, they get to vote they can change the majority of the board any given year. We have five select board members, three of them come up for election each year. Um, I think engaging in this conversation is important, but I also think we have to be careful about setting a precedence. And I don't want Alexandra or Amy or Maroney to, to, to take this the wrong way, but we have to be careful about allowing any self-appointed committee to all of a sudden decide that they're in charge of running the town and that you have to respond to their concerns right now about what's going on. So this issue of racial di diversity training, um, I think it needs to be broadened to just being civil because um, a lot of the things that are posted on front porch forum and a lot of the letters that get sent out that are suggesting that people don't treat others the right way based on race or, or you know, BIPOC community or what have you, um, <clears throat> the, it, it's not just the license to, to uh, kind of run somebody else over with a bulldozer because you think that maybe they're not, um, Treating, treating others well. I think it's something that we all need to learn to try to make sure that we have civil conversations. But I just want to warn the board that you have to be careful about letting, um, it's not a town meeting. And, and I would suggest to Mark and whomever the, the vice chair is uh, to remember, you know, you're, you're the chairman or the, the chairperson of the select board. Um, we don't have a mayor in Waterbury. Each select board member is an equal person. They, they, the, no, the chairperson isn't, does not have any more authority than uh, the most newly elected member. They are equals in their election and you elect a chairperson to run a meeting. Uh, they, they don't lead the community. It's not a leadership position when it comes to the community. And I understand why the perception is that way, but I just want the board to, to be cognizant of the fact that 
these are your meetings and you've got business to conduct. And I, I don't want anybody to hear me saying that this isn't important business that we're talking about right now, but you gotta be careful about how you um, negotiate through this type of issue because uh, you know if there's another group out there who have a, a very different interest and they wanna say, well, this is the main priority for the town, um, you know, you're going to have to deal with that too. So just be careful. Okay. Thank you, Bill. Um, we are going to move on. Um, I suggest anyone that um, wishes to speak more on this, reach out to us individually. I think the one thing I would say is uh, some of us are better by phone. Um, Carla, our phone numbers on the website, or can they reach out, anyone reach out to you for our phone numbers? Because I personally respond better by phone. Um, um, these two emails are on the website, but they can certainly call me to get your phone contact information. Okay, so I hope anyone who wants to additionally comment, please reach out to us individually. I'm happy to speak with anyone. Um, and hopefully um, we'll continue to do the work that we need to do. But um, we also have some agenda items and we are more than an hour behind. So thank you very much for your time. And uh, we will move on to Barb. Thank you so much for being patient. I know we are way behind on your agenda item. So uh, we will okay. consider local emergency management plan. Okay, um, thank you. So um, I was glad to sit in on the conversation, um, very in depth. Um, this, however, is gonna change direction um, at the current time. So every year, a new local emergency management plan is required by the state um, to have updated information on who your local emergency uh, management director is, coordinator, and important um, phone number and contact individuals in case there's an emergency. Um, the purpose of the plan is, um, uh, first of all, for your own community, for our community, to make sure that we all know how things would work in the case there's an emergency. But it's also a um, mechanism that if there is a major disaster, um, one like Irene, um, there is, uh, it allows the town to recoup 75% um, uh, of the cost of the damages and even more than that um, from the state, from the Emergency Relief Assistance Fund. <clears throat> so every year there is an appointment of an emergency management director in, and um, if you choose the emergency management coordinator. Um, I've been talking, I, I am the emergency management director for this last year and have been the coordinator for um, many years prior to this. Um, Michael Bard had expressed interest in helping working on the, uh, work on the plan. And Mike, thank you for a lot of the comments that you provided over the last few months. And I know we've had conversations back and forth and you've had um, quite a bit of training as well, but due to, um, and, and let me know if, if I didn't get this quite right, but due to other circumstances, you didn't wanna take the role of emergency management um, or emergency management director. And so um, Gary Dillon, who was our fire chief for the town of Waterbury and has been for years, is willing to be considered as your emergency management director or EMD. Um, Mike, um, are you still willing to serve as the emergency management coordinator? Yeah, absolutely. I just wanna clarify, the only reason why I didn't really wanna be I'm one that I give my heart and soul to everything, and I was worried because you know I have two. We have two aging parents, myself and my wife. You know, one's a hundred, one's ninety-five. You know, I don't want to be out of town when something kind of happens. You know, plus my camp, we don't have any cell service, so that was more of my concerns. You know, as much as I like to give my heart and soul to the community, I think I can do it as a mer emergency management coordinator. And that's why I kind of stepped back a little bit as much as I thought I would, would like to be the emergency management director. I think Gary would make a fine one, you know, cause a lot of the processes that the fire chief does would be well suited to the emergency management director. Thanks, yep. Thanks Barb. Thank you, Gary's, Gary's well-trained and he's also um, very capable of putting on training sessions and exercises for the, um, the staff and select board members and, and volunteers. So it'd be great. Um, 
not sure what else you need on this. I did notice on the cover page that I sent out, <laughs> uh, Gary's second number, I had a typo on that. So I would like to correct that before it goes into the state. Um, but it does need to be, if you choose to um, support this plan and adopt this plan and elect Gary as your EMD and Mike as your EM coordinator, um, Bill would have to sign it and then Mark Fryer would need to sign it before it gets sent in. And just, I just wanted to let you know a little bit about me. I'm kind of in the same boat as Mike a little bit. Um, I am, I hope this isn't news to you, but I'm retiring later this year. And um, I'm, uh, I'm also taking care of my mother, 90, she'll be 95 next month. Um, she moved in with us a year ago. She's been on hospice for the last few months. And I just, um, I need to change, change up my priorities. So anyway, with that, do you have, does anybody have any questions on the plan that was sent out? Nope, any board members have any questions? Barb, it was a great collaborative. I'm glad all the people that gave comments, what uh, things were considered, and I think it's a very good plan. Thank you. I appreciate that. And then um, we have to make a motion to. to yes. Okay. Anyone want to make the motion? We did speak with Gary, and Gary is willing to be the emergency management director. Okay. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, it's not a surprise. <laughs> I'll move to adopt the emergency management plan as written in its most recent form. Do you, do you want to include um, appointing Gary and Mark in that same motion? Okay, yes. Yep. Second. 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 Katie. Seconded. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you very much. Barb, great. have a great night. Okay, great. Thank you. You too. Manager's items, Perry Hill Partners appeal. Yeah, so uh, we talked a little bit about this under the interim zoning bylaws, but um, uh, the Perry Hill Partners did appeal their uh, the deny the denial of the BRB to a superior court. Um, you authorized me to uh, hire an attorney to make an appearance for the town. The attorney, um, Dave Lou, has been working through the court with the, uh, with the plaintiff's um, lawyers as well. And the schedule right now is that um, they all know that the uh, interim bylaws that we talked about tonight are up for a public hearing on the 26th. They know that there is hope that the select board will be able to adopt that or something like that, uh, that would allow a permit to be uh, submitted under those interim bylaws and then reviewed by the BRB and potentially resolve the issue. <clears throat> but at this point, there's still a chance the select board says, no, we're not going to adopt these. And there's still a chance that even though they're adopted, that the Perry Hill partners decide to move forward with the appeal as opposed to apply for a new permit. So having said all that, uh, the two attorneys for the two parties have agreed that uh, mediation is the next step uh, ordered by the court. Um, they have chosen the mediator and I, I have forgotten the mediator's name right now. And um, the select board needs to appoint someone to be the town's representative at mediation if we get there. Mediation is scheduled to happen around May 21st. If, um, if the interim bylaws are approved next week and the applicant uh, decides to apply for a new permit, the mediation may not be necessary. Uh, we're hoping it won't be necessary because obviously that costs money. Um, so the select board needs to appoint a mediator. Um, the select board has appointed me in the past uh, many times to, to represent the, uh, the town in mediation. Uh, the select board can appoint one of its own if it, if it prefers. Uh, the mediator, uh, the representative for the mediator has to have the authority 
to negotiate in good faith with the town with the expectation that whatever mediation is agreed to by the media, mediator and the parties would be brought back and uh, uh, approved by the select board. Um, obviously, the select board would not have to uh, approve whatever the mediated settlement is, but the, uh, the court likes to have um, consensus from the parties that the people who are there at the mediation really do have the authority to act in the name of the town. So uh, my recommendation would be that you appoint me as the mediator, but if one of you would prefer to do it, uh, you can appoint one of your own and that's okay by me too. Uh, board members have any comment? I don't see why we wouldn't. I think Bill would do an excellent job. And as long as, Bill, you said you were good with being that representative. Um, anyone have a reason otherwise? Otherwise, do we need to make a motion? Yeah, you need to make a motion to appoint whomever it is. So if you want to make a motion to appoint me, you need to make that motion and name me. And go from there. I'll, I'll move to appoint Bill um, mediator for the municipality in the case uh, between Par Perry Hill Partners in the town. Second. Second. Been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you, Bill. Sure. Uh, the paving plan is really pretty quick. Uh, I've actually asked Carla to put that on the next agenda. Um, I do want to report to the board uh, when we put the um, when we put the CIP together this year and we budgeted money for paving. Um, the expectation was, or the hope was, that we were going to pave uh, Stowe Street, and uh, we're applying for a um, paving grant, Class Two paving grant from the state of Vermont. $175,000 and the Stowe Street project is going to cost about $305,000. Um, we have applied for that grant, but um, the state has indicated that it is going to be a little while before we get the grant, uh, before we get notified of whether or not we, we receive the grant. Um, the grant, if awarded, has, uh, I think it's a 30 month time frame in which we can do the work. So uh, Bill Woodruff and I, the public works director and I have talked about this. I think it would be best if we just move ahead and plan to pay Blush Hill and potentially part of uh, Lonesome Trail this year. So if we get the grant, um, we would take advantage of the time frame that we have and actually schedule that work on Stowe Street in 2022, as opposed to now. Uh, we're trying to work with the contractors. Uh, if we get the grant, we have to put the project out to bid, formal bids. Uh, if we don't use the paving grant, then we can just negotiate with uh, pavers like we like we always do. Um, there's a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, there's basically three paving companies that, that we try to work with. The two bigger ones uh, are tentative about what they might be able to do. So for this year, I would like to switch gears and concentrate on Blush Hill. And if we find out that we get the paving grant, then we can uh, cycle Stowe Street in for next year. I think if we, if we have to wait until we find out whether we get the grant or not, uh, we're gonna be too much behind the eight ball to, to maybe even get the job done at all. And I don't wanna miss a paving season. So uh, 
you don't have to make any decisions right now because I'm gonna put this on the agenda for the third. <clears throat> I've asked Woody to get some additional pricing because we've got to figure out how we're gonna approach Flush Hill. I told you earlier in the year that there's a, a pretty large culvert up just before you get to Wendell's Low, Wendell Low House in the dip just beyond um, the Lonesome Trail intersection. Uh, we're not going to be able to get that culvert installed this year. There's no way we're going to be able to do that. So I've got Bill working on some pricing to come back to the board with a fuller proposal, but we'll talk about that at the next meeting. Okay. Uh, board members, any comments? One question, Bill. Um, are there other culverts that'll need replacing that Bill, you'll be addressing during yeah, the interim? There, there's, a, there's a couple of small culverts on Blush Hill and on Lonesome Trail that, that we can take care of. And Celia's, Celia was planning to do that this year anyway, even if we were going to pave that road a year from now. But yeah, we'll, and those are things that will are already in the works. So uh, we'll take care of those. And there's also that transition. I'm up there working now on, on actually on Lonesome Trail, but I noticed this winter there's that transition right at the end of Lonesome Trail where the pavement meets the dirt this spring that was just yeah unbelievable. Well, I, I've actually that's that's one of the things that I've asked Bill to look at. Um, I think for a lot of reasons, even though we're not really in the mode of paving or turning a lot of gravel roads into paved roads. That last section there, um, when you get the wrong kind of rain, we can lose a lot of that uh, surface on that gravel road pretty easily. And the other thing, it's, you know, it's a pretty short stretch and to have to always, you know, send a grader up there to deal with that is a little bit of a you know, it's kind of inefficient. So I'm, I'm asking Woody to, to kind of get some prices to see what we might be able to do with getting that whole rest of it paved. I think it'll be a much better um, road in the long run if we do that. Yeah, well, there, there seems to be a, some kind of a soil issue there, right, right where the two meet. Right. Uh, yeah. It needs probably to be addressed before that happens. But yeah, yeah. well, that's good. I'm, I'm glad to hear it. All right, so we'll talk about that more at the next meeting, but that's what the heads up is for now. Um, personnel and staffing issues. Um, it's kind of interesting that when we talked about the uh, pay raises and the like last, last meeting, um, one of you made the comment that, you know, we don't have a lot of turnover. And, and that's really not so true anymore. The first uh, 20 years that I worked here, uh, we had almost no turnover, but the last 10 years um, in every department, we, we have had much more turnover than, than um, we used to have, um, including even in the highway department, even though nothing really has happened in, in, the, in the past three or four years, but we have had significant turnover. Um, you may know this uh, just from talking to the community, but we have had uh, quite a lot of turnover recently in the, in the library, uh, and that stretches back um, over a year, almost a year and a half now. Uh, but uh, we had a couple of people that left a year or so ago, but just recently, uh, Jill Chase has retired. Uh, she's been working with the library for quite a long time. Uh, her last day, I think, may have actually already happened, uh, but Jill has retired. Uh, Maggie Cleary uh, just turned in her uh, resignation last week. Um, Daphne Jackson, who's a part-time employee, uh, who's only been with us for about uh, less than a year, she resigned a month or so ago. And at the library commissioners meeting um, a week ago, the library director, Almi, uh, gave this letter and she asked me to read it to the select board. Dear select board members, I'm writing to inform you that I'll be leaving my post at the library on June 2nd, 2021. I've been struggling with a health issue for a few months into COVID. 
not COVID, but she's been struggling with a health issue uh, a few months after COVID started. I've come to the decision several weeks ago that I need to lower my stress levels and give myself some time to get better. I've grown fond of Waterway, it's wonderful people, and I'm proud of the work we've done at the library since I began here in August 2018. Wishing you all the best, Almi Landauer. So um, Almi has uh, tendered her resignation. Uh, she'll be working uh, about six weeks more. Uh, the library commissioners are already gearing up for a search for the new library director. So uh, there's been quite a bit of um, Maroney kind of indicated a, a little while ago, you know, he's got a, a recent nasty email. There's been uh, a number of members of the public concerned about kind of the revolving door that's been going on in the library. Um, but it is what it is right now, and Almi uh, has indicated that she's leaving because of her health issues, not because of other personnel issues. And she wanted that to be clear to the commissioners, and I'm sure to you as well. Um, and just for Danny's benefit, I think the rest of the select board members know uh, the library is the one, um, uh, the one department of the town and EFUD that I do not directly supervise. Uh, the library commissioners are elected directly by the public and the law with regard to libraries uh, stipulates that the library directors, I mean that the library uh, commissioners appoint the director of the library and the library director appoints and supervises the, the library staff. So I don't have a direct role in hiring any of the library employees um, and uh, it's something that the library directors are kind of uh, struggling with a bit now. So that's the news there. The one action item that I would like from the select board, uh, I did mention at the last meeting that we have this very old personnel policy and that we tried back in 2013 and 14 to get it uh, get it readopted and then we kind of fumbled it and we still haven't gotten that done. I told you that I've been in contact with Schutzel, Page and Fletcher and you authorized uh, the, uh, you know, moving forward with that. Uh, when I met with the library commissioners and then the EFUD commissioners last week, I asked them if they would appoint one member of their board to serve as a personnel committee, if you will, to work with me and the, and the attorney when we get going on this in another couple of weeks. Uh, so I'd like the select board to appoint one of its members to serve on this personnel committee. And the reason why I'm suggesting this committee is that when we did this back in 2013 and 14, and Chris Rienz will remember, you know, we had five members of you know, three boards there and three members of another board. And it's just a lot of people to try to, to, you know, kind of move forward in a meeting. And it was a little bit more inefficient than I thought. What the hope is that each of the boards that I work for will appoint a, a person to work with me and the attorney to kind of put the flesh onto the skeleton of a policy that he already has, and then go back to the boards and discuss it, get comments, and, and then use the, you know, the committee process to get this done. I think it will work a lot better than trying to have 15 or 18 people involved in working with the attorney. So that's my recommendation that you appoint one member of your board to work with me and the, and the attorney and the representative from the other boards. Anyone um, want to volunteer for that? I don't think I personally have enough capacity. Mike? I'd be glad to. I have a, a pretty substantial background from my role as program director in USDA rural development with personnel um, decisions, you know, hiring, firing, you know, you know, management of people. So I think I could help Bill. So unless someone else has a strong desire 
I'd be more than glad to serve in that capacity. Any other board members? Okay. Um, yeah, obviously the turnover is concerning. Um, hopefully it is just timing. I know out in the general employee market base right now, it's rather light. So um, hopefully we can find someone to replace Omni and please extend our thanks to everything that she's done for the board. She'll be at your next meeting. Um, she still wants to, you know, have her regular communication. Um, she couldn't make it tonight. And because Ward was getting out on this, she just wanted you folks to know now, but I think she'll be at the one of the main meetings. I'm not sure it'll be the third or the second one, but uh, anyway, thanks. Okay. Uh, everyone okay if Mike's reps us? Um, yeah, that's fine. Do we need to vote on that? Yeah, I would. I just to make it official. And it's placing him on what's the what is the correct verbiage? Uh, I would just say the uh, personnel policy committee is fine. Someone want to make that motion? So moved. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Thanks, Mike. Yeah, I can't think of a better person for the for the position. So, <laughs> hey, personnel issues are some of the hardest you'll ever deal with. But you know, it's just you have to be open and be fair, and that's if you go with that, you're fine. Um, it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. Um, reopening plan for the municipality. Yeah. So. Um, hey. <laughs> Barb. Uh, Barb has uh, been our liaison and, and has been working closely with the, the group from town that really pays attention to what's going on at the governor's press conferences and has been a wealth of information during this whole time. Um, the state has put out new opening guidelines. Uh, this is dated as of April 9th. And, um, there's a universal guideline, and then there's a group B section, which um, has to do with um, meetings of public bodies, among other things. So uh, I'm not gonna read this to you now, but um, based on the information here, I'm thinking that probably in June, we can, we can start back with uh, meetings in person. Um, we're still going to have to, through July anyway, um, limit capacity in the steel room. Um, there's two formulas that, uh, that they put out there, um, but you have to be able to meet the six foot social distancing requirements as well as the occupancy limits. Our steel room can hold 80 people uh, one of the uh, one of the equations basically says 50%. So we could put 40 people in there, but 40 people can't be six feet apart if we put all 40 in there. The other one is uh, one person per 100 square feet of space. Uh, that's the other formula. Um, we've got almost 1,200 feet of space, so we can have 12 people under that formula. So I think we can split the difference and probably have uh, 25 people in the room. Between now and June, I'll have Woody measure the room and you know space things out to make sure that we can all be uh, apart um, that six foot spacing and still have 25 people in there. The 25 people, of course, include the board members and the staff. So you know there's five board members. There's Carla and myself who always come to meetings and occasionally some other staff. So we may have, you know, seven to 10 staff persons and board members, uh, which would allow, you know, maybe up to 15, uh, 15 or 17 members of the public. To the point that um, Alexia made uh, earlier in the evening about continuing with Zoom meetings, I think we really have, uh, this is a, an area where the world has changed. And I think uh, trying to go back to just 
in-person meetings. Uh, even if we get the all clear that COVID is wiped out and it's gone and uh, we can go back to how it was in you know, February of 2020, uh, I just don't think the public will, um, will feel happy about that because as has been pointed out, uh, not just on snowy evenings, but for working people, people who have families, it's a lot easier to tune in from home and watch what's going on. Even if they don't have to participate, I think we all agree that we have had many more people at these meetings uh, through Zoom than we generally have um, in an in-person meeting. So I think we'll be uh, having hybrid meetings. We've already bought some equipment. Uh, we've bought a, a camera microphone system uh, that's called the OWL. It, it will be set up somewhere in the room and it, the, it's a voice activated camera that swivels 360 degrees. So whomever speaks, the the camera will uh, focus on that person, whether it's a member of the board or staff or even a member of the public. Uh, and uh, people at home will be able to hear. Uh, figuring out how we're going to be able to interact with the people at home, uh, I'm sure it's it's will be easily figured out by someone other than me since I'm almost as far to the non-computer person as Chris Yens is, but uh, um, we'll figure that out. But I, I think we're, I think the uh, remote meetings or access remotely to these meetings is here to stay. And we will try to do our best to make that work as well as we can for the public. But speaking for myself, I find in-person meetings a whole lot easier to deal with when I'm interacting with the board. Um, it's a dangerous thing, but being able to see everybody at once and pay attention to their body language and, and other things just makes it for a, a, a better meeting uh, in many respects and being able to, uh, to share information. Uh, it's a little easier in person. So anyway, that's the plan. I've already um, allowed or told Almi at the library that she could allow John Malter to, to um, uh, reserve the steel room sometime in June for his composting meeting that he holds. The 25 person limit is in place. So uh, we've got the, the next uh, two meetings in May that we'll have just like we are right now. And hopefully for the first meeting in June, we'll be able to be in, in the steel room. Having said that, if any board member feels uncomfortable still about coming to the meeting, uh, we will have the remote capability. We'll have this hybrid uh, uh, capability available. So if, if anyone on the board uh, or even staff is concerned about being in person, you can certainly stay home and continue to meet um, remotely. So that's the plan. Okay, um, we're gonna, Mike. Mike. Thanks, yeah, Mike. I, Bill, one, I, one, just quickly, I echo your comments. I think hybrid is the way to go. But one comment on some of your spatial things, I think the spatial thing is also mitigated by you don't have to count people who are vaccinated. So if if you're, I know how, I don't know how you're gonna do that. I know I have my vaccine card, but you know, that is a criteria that helps you get some more, some more folks in an area. And I don't know how we feel about that, how we want to administer. Yeah, well, it's, it's a little bit of a challenge. Um, typically you're not, allowed to ask people about medical questions. And, and I really don't want to be the, the vaccine police. We've talked a little bit at staff level. Most of the staff members are being vaccinated. Uh, I don't know if there's anyone on staff who, who refuses to, to be vaccinated. But um, you know, this may evolve, Mike. But at the beginning, when we start in June, I'm going to stick to that 25 limit. When we get to July, 
unless something changes. And of course, this is all subject to change anytime. Obviously, you know, every time we make progress, then I hear Dr. Fauci talking today about, well, you know, it's unbelievable, but it seems like there's a political divide about who's getting vaccinated, depending upon what political party that they're belonging to. And, you know, from his perspective, he thinks that's, that's a shame and it's, uh, you know, puts us in jeopardy of going back the other direction. And there may be people who think his opinion is hogwash, but, um, you know, the, the reality is, is that in some places, um, cases are spiking again. Michigan is having a terrible trouble of late. So we're going to have to just pay attention to what comes out of the governor's office. But right now, this is the most up-to-date information we have. So we're going to plan to have our first hybrid meetings in June. And as I said, for anybody who's not comfortable coming, you can certainly feel free to continue to meet remotely and participate that way. Uh, and we'll do our best to make sure that the system works well for everyone, no matter where they are. Bill, I agree with your comments. And, you know, I was on several of the sessions for the town office education conference, and one was with the state epidemiologists. And I asked in the chat, you know, even things like, you know, I said, well, in 2021, are we going to see county fairs? And she said, absolutely. Uh, so if you're looking at large gatherings such as, uh, you know, the, the Champlain Valley Fair or Tunbridge Fair, I think things are going to be, and things are all, as you said, subject to change. You know, things get worse, but I'm hoping, you know, I think Waterbury's numbers for vaccination, are pre, you know, in Washington County in general, are pretty high. And I think, you know, once we get to July, I think you're going to see some very high vaccination numbers, which is going to open up things, which I think is going to be good for the economy, good for all of our psychological well-beings. So, my opinion. And I saw your hand up. Uh, question to Bill. Um, does that mean the video, we won't be or I won't be doing the videos because you've got this new system. I I don't know, and um, you know the the new system. Uh, work is here tonight. Um, they'll be able to come in through remote. So that's between that's Orca's decision how they want to do it. It's really not my decision. Well, if you've got that new system, ARCA could come in on that. That's what I'm saying. They're, they're here now remotely. Yeah. Uh, they can be on that remotely and they'll see whatever is happening with that OWL camera. So they can do it. Whether I don't know what the quality is to take that and then put it, you know, try to put it on TV. That That's that's not really my uh, my very okay. All right, I'll I'll check with uh, with Orca, see what they want to do. Thank you. All right, um, I believe that takes us through the agenda. One thing I wanted to point out here on the bottom, what was this called? This little uh, it's parking, a parking lot. lot. <laughs> so this is our beginnings of our idea of how we can start to track topics that we table for later and we can talk about how we'll use this portion in our area but um that's why you see that it, it allows us and the public to know that we might speak to it if we have time and we find ourselves with time but since we are an hour past the end of the meeting we will not discuss any of that this evening but um, just know that that's how we are going to um, start to try to organize things that, that we hope to discuss later. Um, so feel free to add anything to that area and then we can talk about um, more strategies in terms of prioritizing, but hopefully that, that's an explanation on why you saw that. And uh, yeah, so um, thank you, Danny and Bill for that suggestion. Motion to adjourn. Can I just, and I don't know if this needs to happen before you adjourn, could I just trouble, uh, 
Mike, Chris, and uh, Mark to check your emails and let me know if you got the letters. I heard back from Danny and I know. I got it. That too. was Danny? I did get it, yes. Okay, so Chris and Mike. I resent the one from the outreach committee and then I sent one for mine. You got it? You're on mute. I just checked, I, I, I got um, mine. We, we have learned to uh, have troubles with our muting buttons sometimes. <laughs> <I know. laughs> okay, awesome. And Chris, were you able to, did you get yours as well? You're on mute as well. Yes, no, you're on mute. Chris, you're muted. No, I just said, pardon for my ignorance, but I don't know how to check it without, with, I don't know how to check it. It's, I'm not a computer guy. Um, okay. if, I had my, if I had my phone here, I could look on that, but my wife ran upstairs okay. with it for some reason. And so I'll, right. have to, I'll have to confirm. Got okay. it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Yeah, you too. Okay. Uh, it's been moved to adjourn. Is there a second? Oh, second. All right. Amen. Discussion. All those in favor, please say aye. Have a great night, everybody. Bye. Good night. Good night, everyone. <laughs>